Okay, good morning. So uh, this is going to be an exciting and very inspirational session. Um, and, uh, you know, Venkat just reminded me when we met in Charlotte, we were just planning for this meeting. And uh, I guess somewhere during having coffee, we must have mentioned a book, which is called uh, From Good to Great by uh, Jim Collins. And I think it's Scott Potter. It's a very sort of inspirational book on uh, how to run uh, how to it's it's really about leadership and teamwork and we've heard a lot about it including dr schwen's uh, oration so we've got three very inspiring uh, talks and great speakers and uh, without taking much time i want to invite uh, uh, our local host dr raj sekran the title of his talk is from individual to institution dr raj sekran Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. So when this uh, session was being planned, uh, Venkat requested that this was a suggestion from Sanjay, and then he requested me to talk about this topic. So I've been thinking about this for the past few days. And I think in our long professional life, we all have many milestones that we cross. And when we cross these milestones, we have the two options. One is we can just have a morphological growth. We can become bigger and bigger in what we are doing. You're a spine surgeon, okay, you operated 250 cases this year, then it's 300 the next year, 500 the next year. Or you can have a transformational growth. You completely change. You change for the better and you have more impact. Now, who wants to be just a caterpillar, becoming bigger and bigger every time? And there is a need that you need to change to a butterfly, a transformation. And I think just like there is a transformation to caterpillar to butterfly, I think the biggest transformation that will happen in a professional life is when you transform from an individual to an institution. Now, why institutions? Why can't you just be a better version of yourself? just be a better individual all the time. I think if you want to live your dream, your ambition, and achieve something for yourself, then it's enough if you're a good individual. But if you want to do something for the society that will stay on, leave a legacy, I think then you need to create an institution. Now, if you want to live your solo dance, okay, individual is enough. But if you want to leave an impactful legacy, make an impact, a dent on the society, then you need. I'll just tell a small example. Now, this is something that will go in for an amputation. And if it's a dream to be a reconstructive surgeon and to reconstruct this to something like this and give the hand back to a person, then it's okay. If you have to do it occasionally, an individual surgeon is enough. But if you have to do this for a society on a long-term basis, any day, any night that the patient comes, whether it's a Christmas, New Year, even when you are abroad, whatever it happens, then you need an institution to do it. 
Now, institution building is what will leave goodness for the society. And there is a lot of goodness in this Chinese proverb. If you want to walk fast and achieve something for yourself, then you run alone. But if you want to walk far and create something good for everybody else, walk together. So I think Madam also might touch upon this topic when she speaks. So I have been a part of building an institution by providence and by design, not by personal uh, uh, accomplishment. But this was what we took over as 17 beds and two operating rooms from my father and my brother and I. Now, this is a 510 bed hospital. And in a few months, it will be 675 beds and will be one of the largest centers in the world. I'll just tell what we have learned through this journey. Now, building an institution and sustaining an institution are two different things. Building an institution is not so difficult. An institution will be built by somebody's ambition, by somebody's power of passion. Everything can happen. But if you look at the natural history of institutions, you'll be really surprised that by 25 years of an institution being built, 79% of them are gone or completely static. And by 50 years, 89% of them are gone, which means only 11% of institutions start and maintain the growth at 50 years. And that brings us to the question, rather than building, what sustains an institution and what makes it grow? And this, when we started our institution, we learned it from Aravind Hospital. And we knew that institutions are powered by purpose beyond self. I mean, it depends upon what is your defining ambition of doing that thing. Now, if you look at Arvind Hospital, from a humble beginning of 12 beds in 1978, that was the year I joined medical college. And it's the most leading eye care provider, even by 1991. Three lakhs, 18,000 surgeries, with 60% of them free. If you see what powered them, it is their vision to focus on improving the total health of the country. If you look at it, that is a broad-based vision. Eliminate needless blindness. And there is nothing like market share or shareholder or profit or personal aim, personal gain. And this is what actually sustains uh, people. So if you want to have an institution, then you must have something much more than what is relevant to just you and your family and your nearby ones. The second major thing, it involves a lot of sacrifice, risks, and innovations on the way. Now, about sacrifice and risks, all of us know, but you will also have to put a lot of innovations uh, onto where you go. Now, when we started in 1991, we had the idea, and we wanted to ape Aravind Hospital to build the best trauma service. They wanted to do blindness. We wanted to take up trauma service, spine, and microsurgery. When we started that, many people told us why we can't do it, and we found that there are three big obstacles for doing that on the Aravind scale. Ability, affordability, and availability, and affordability was a big problem. And when patients came with accidents, major accidents like this, nobody had money in their pocket when they had an accident. And if you had to bring the payment at that percent of time where you need to do an emergency surgery, that was a big hold. And so we brought the rule that nobody need to pay on admission when they get with an accident. That was actually a game changer. And in the whole region, people, when they fell down, they always thought, let's go to Ganga, because irrespective of whether we are able to pay or now or afterwards, you will get a good treatment. And that actually made lots of these. We are very happy that over a period of time, that more than thousands and thousands of amputational limbs have been saved because of this one single policy of putting the patient first than ourselves. Now, this always gives a win-win situation. More than 2.5 lakhs injured patients have been operated. It built a trust that allows us to operate and to have more than 15,000 major trauma surgeries every year. And that automatically puts you into a institutional leadership position across the world. Big numbers also allow you to innovate on a business model. And that is why we could do a replantation for less than one lakh. You could correct. We are the largest persons who correct spinal deformities for on the Tamil Nadu Chief Minister scheme for just 65,000 rupees. 
major multiple reconstructions for just 1.5 lakhs. But you know, it really does good. Because when Justice Shivraj Patel, Supreme Court judge, visited us, he says, this is good going for you, you are really fortunate because rich people will pay, but all the poor people will pray. And you know, this is something that really pushes over this. And we grew in great proportions and volume took care of it when people could not pay. And we could get the low cost, high quality care. And that's why we have more than 150 overseas surgeons also visiting us every year to look at the low cost, high quality model. Now you'll understand that this growth was not by having clever business managers or promotion departments within the hospital, but it was just by following our mission statement to the word that the expertise of the institution should be available to every citizen of this country. So I think you should put a purpose which is larger than yourself, something to the common good. And when you take care of that common good, the nature will take care of what it needs to be. Another few learning points that we have had on the way when you have to build institutions. All institutions need a leader. I mean, that should be a leadership guidance. Because into your institution and into your team, you will attract a lot of brilliant people. And it is very disastrous to have very clever, brilliant people if they are all looking at different ways. And there needs to be someone who will put everybody onto the line and you need a leadership guidance. That should be discipline, hierarchy, and leadership in the uh, whole team. I think this is very important. There is no institution where everybody are equal. If everybody is the same, then that is a problem. So whenever we have uh, a new consultant coming into our uh, team, I always tell them, most of them are home, home ground. But I always tell them on the day that they become the consultant, from today I will think of you as my equal. But if you think me as your equal, then it is a disaster. So it is a very, such a healthy relationship. When the top person looks at everybody down as their equal, gives a lot of respect. But the lower persons actually look up to their seniors with a lot of respect and hierarchy. Then that is a very important thing for institution. The leader, if you want to build an institution, must also look more at what is necessary for the team and also be willing to lose your identity in the identity of your institution. So we need to look at what keeps the team together and what tears them apart. And I think one of the most important thing is that in the institution, everybody must be looking at the larger picture. Now, when I was listening to one of the very important talks by Rahul Bajaj on what gave them leadership, he said his primary work in the whole business is to make sure that everybody is painting a picture, but all of them are painting the same picture. So that's very important for everybody to have and look at the larger picture of what you're doing. This is a slide I put everywhere that if you get a situation like this at night, 11 o'clock, then the whole team can look at it as work. Oh, you have to resuscitate, you have to debride, you have to fix the humerus, you have to do arterial repair, median nerve repair, pedicle LD flap, and then you get tired even before you start. But if you look at it as this is a golden opportunity for you to give back the right arm to a 10-year-old girl, she will play with her classmates as before, her dreams in life will be sustained, and you are giving back the society, and then you see afterwards that what you have done and slogged through the night has really literally transformed and touched the life of not just the girl, but the whole family and the society as a whole, then that is something later that it will keep in. So if the in teams look at the larger picture, then the institution already grows. Now the team means it's just not the medical team, but it's the nurses, it's the paramedical people and the administration, everybody. And if everybody is aligned, everybody is looking at the larger picture, everybody is print, painting the same picture, then institutions really go well. A good leader also must be willing to lose your individual identity and the institution. In Tamil, they say nothing grows under a banyan tree. So when you grow big, you need to allow other people to grow. And it's a matter of pride that every consultant in our hospital actually outshine. Actually, they are doing much better at their age than what I was doing in that age. 
And this is something tremendously important. So when I became the president of ASSI and then I was in the executive, the day that my colleague, Dr. Ajay Shetty, came into the executive committee, I stopped attending the executive committees because he needed to have a say. And having me sitting in front of him all the time, he will be always looking up to me and what I am saying. So I said I would stop attending the executive committee so that he is the leader in the executive committee in his own right way. And it's a matter of pride that all our consultants are thriving very well in their respective fields. The fourth important thing for the leader is to push the team continuously for higher things. The greatest danger is that we should not be stagnating. If a team stagnates, the institution will break. Nobody likes to be in a team which is stagnating. I mean, every team needs a fast movement, and it is actually the continuous movement and continuous progress which keeps institutions together. Now, there is no, as Sri Arbindo said, there is no more benumbering error than to mistake a stage for a goal. This is very important. I mean, if we mistake every stage for our goal, then this is a disaster. And to linger too long in the resting place is also a disaster. This will happen, but it is important for every institution to set goals every time and keep pushing more and more and more so that things work well. Last is, have God and nature on your side. I think this is the insurance for institution. So everybody asks, how does the institution grow? I'll say you'll have to have good insurance. And the insurance is to have God and nature on your side. So how do you do it? You need to give back to the society what the society has given back to you. And this is primarily very, very important. Now, throughout our this thing, every two or three years, we start major projects which give back to the society. Under Project Spring Spines, we have actually collected more than 750 spines like this at no cost to the patient or at a cost of less than 60,000 to the patient. I mean, this is a huge, I mean, when we talk to the West, people don't believe it. And so the executive committee of the SRS, US, actually came to see whether it's possible. And then they saw that and gave us the Walter Blount Humanitarian Award. On the plastic surgery side, they have the hope after fire. You can see that people who have had severe contractures, people who have never used their limbs for years together, they all get a completely free surgery with collaboration from the Rotary Foundation. And in the project of freedom from pain, people who are like this, we convert them. We look at 20% of our work to be on the social service side. I think this is something more important than doing more uh, surgeries. And when Suhashini, all of you might know, when she visited the hospital for something, she said, visiting the hospital and seeing your projects made me believe in God for a person who is a non-believer. Because God resides not in the imaginations, but in the good intentions of people like you. Now, if you have this, you give back a major portion of what you have got back from the society, then you can be absolutely sure that your institution is insured by nature and you will progress full. So in our long professional life, if we have to leave a legacy behind, then I think we all start at individuals, we all transform to better individuals, we continuously strive to be better version of ourselves. We then form a part of the team, which is the next most important thing to do when you are the best version of yourself. But the last, to leave a legacy and leave an impactful contribution to the society, I think we should be an institution builder. So thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. And welcome. <clears throat> Wow, Venkat, just please make sure this talk goes on the website and stays there. This is a changer for a lot of us. Next, uh, I would like to call Dr. Vino Aram to give her talk. It's for caring for a child and a community. Vino, thank you. It's wonderful to speak after Dr. Rajshekran because I think he's at a point in his career 
where looking back is possible. And when Dr. Raj Shekran called me to speak at this session, um, this is the image that I had in my mind. Where am I? Um, and do I have enough perspective to look back at a, at a career and an experience to speak of this transformation between good and great? I don't think I have that experience yet, but what Dr. Raj Shekran gave me um, is a moment to reflect and introspect. So I might continue the same trend that he started of looking inward uh, and looking at the chosen vocation um, of serving children through health. Now, as many of us do when we have to do a talk, you go up and hit the Google button. Um, good is described both as an adjective and a noun. An adjective because it says to be desired or approved of, and the second one that came with the adjective was having the required qualities. Uh, of a high standard. Um, quick also was what you saw below is the noun, that which is morally right and righteous. I'm just going to leave it at that, but I think this gives us uh, a quick snapshot as to uh, the journey of a young professional. And maybe I'm somewhere in the middle now uh, looking at my own journey. I think what stayed with me is the adjective description of good. And the second one, which is uh, an immediate uh, point of evaluation, which is do I have the required qualities of a high standard? You know, I was thinking of the first uh, part uh, of my presentation. I want to kind of look back and see when did I feel good being someone who could practice child health? And it immediately brought me back to a hospital in Coimbatore, not very far away, which is still the busiest children's hospital where I grew up and I was shaped in my early phases. I was a junior medical doctor, and I was under the training of a very inspiring mentor, someone that Dr. Raj Shekhar and I have worked with. He's turning 80 this year. He's built the entire architecture of pediatric practice in this city, comes from a small village, went to the United States, and came back and built the pediatric uh, architecture here the children's hospital, the academic institutions, the first neonatal unit. What did it mean to train under, under an inspiring mentor? The three things that, if I look back now, I trained uh, under him in 1995 to, 90, to 2000, was that there was always this discourse on possibilities. He kept on saying mortality indicators can be changed. He kept on telling new treatment protocols can be brought in. He kept on telling the infrastructure can be expanded. He kept on telling us that we have a role to play in changing the health of children in the city. Here was a man from a little village in pre-independent India who went, studied, became a pediatrician. He was the second pediatrician of the city and kept doing that to every single healthcare provider, including me, giving me the power, the capacity, and the opportunity to grow. He, just like Dr. Raj Shekhar presented in the Ganga Hospital model, created this ecosystem of excellence. Nothing poor quality was acceptable. It was non-negotiable. Um, let me just give you two quick examples from my experience working with him. I was posted as a junior doctor in the outpatient department. Every day in the evening he was there. And amidst the many questions he asked me, he, uh, he said, do you remember the names of the children you saw? I must confess on the first day I was so worried to get my diagnosis right that I remembered not a single child's name consciously. Saturday came and he asked me the same question. I could remember every single child. It seems very trivial, but what he told me at the end on Saturday evening was, next time the child comes to you, call the child by his or her name. A relationship will be formed between you and the child and the family, and you will have a much better possibility in making the child healthy. I've never forgotten that. 20 years into practice, every single child's name I try to remember every single child's name. The second thing that I took from that ecosystem of excellence is the world really is your classroom. Here was a man, not the, the internet was not as active as it is today, who constantly retrieved global resources for us. He reminded us that as a healthcare provider, your classroom is not limited and excellence is excellence for everybody. The third thing that I found was the power of a junior doctor real-time application. 
I did something, I saw the results, I believed in it. Every time I did this, this became an affirming experience. When you work in a good institution, there is a lot of positive peer pressure. You do well, and you do well in the right things. Just like Team Ganga did not believe in promotion, I was in a system where your own clinical skills and your own abilities made you to excel and shine. Shine individually and shine as a team. And then in that process, in those few years when I was working there, I found slowly but surely what my unique differential was. Research abilities, ability to describe patients, to lead our clinical meetings. I found my own capacities in this system. And what I heard day in and day out in the clinical meeting was, you are changing the lives of children, exactly what Dr. Raj Shekhar said. Not only in terms of medicine, he kept reminding us, because this was a general pediatric institution, he kept reminding us of the milestones that we as a country had crossed and we as a country had to cross. There was a sense of empowerment. I felt very powerful being a doctor and a junior doctor at it. I wasn't a senior doctor. I wasn't a team leader. I had no publications behind me. But I felt a very early sense of empowerment. I was, for the first time, able to articulate in my own words what professional ethics meant. Not an oath that I took, but an experience that I lived. And here, though, if I summarize, these were the three things that defined my first um, uh, phase of my life. External validation. I found that. I experienced that. There was a valuation of my skills, and there was a success that I could define. The best numbers in the OP that I hit as a junior doctor was to see 64 patients, and I had no errors. The case sheets were looked at. We, I had good clinical skills that I was proud of, and very aware that what we as a team were doing was unusual for Coimbatore City. We were seeing 60,000 children annually. I felt good. Feeling good inside was for me, therefore, a sign of being good. And I want to present this to you because many of you might be as senior as Dr. Raj Shekhar. Some of you might be in the middle of your professional careers, and some of you might just be starting. This internal experience as a junior uh, doctor is very important. It sets the foundation of what you want to do later. And I'm ever grateful to Dr. Ramaswamy, his name I will mention, who was my mentor. At 80 today, we exchange emails every day. He never forgets to forward me an article, and I never for, uh, forget to forward him my papers and presentations, a red line, and he would say, this can be improved still. Or when he writes a commencement address, he sends to me and says, Vinu, do you have any inputs? These relationships are precious, very important in these journeys of success and progress. This is the first part of my presentation. I learned to care for a child. I learned and I practiced the 20th century science of child health. I want to remind ourselves that this is not a very old speciality. And we have a lot more to go if we want to change the world, um, especially the experience of the two billion children who live in this world. I therefore also want to pause and look back at everything else that I accrued from this country. Something that we take for granted, the ecosystems, the broader ecosystems in which we grow. I was born in Nagaland, Dr. Rajshekhan asked me the other day, in the northeastern states of India, which, is, which has very poor indicators in economics, but very, high, very good indicators in, in social, on the social side. I grew up where there was no Tamil spoken. I grew up in a context where boys and girls were equal. I grew up in a context where demographics were not of the same side. But I knew as I grew in different parts of India that there were certain drivers of change that this country has uniquely for itself, diversity. Within one country, the diversity of experience that you can accrue, you don't have to travel very far, this country gives you that. The dividends of freedom, life expectancy, a very simple indicator. I keep looking at it every five years. 32 when my mother was born in 1941, 64 now when we deliver a baby girl in any one of the uh, labor wards. Drive for equality. You speak to the previous generation, their mandate was equality. Beyond caste lines, beyond gender, beyond urban-rural divides. The, def the deference for individual choice was just growing. These social drivers of change influence our own sector today. 
that drive of equality is what Dr. Raj Shekharin speaks today of giving back. That, that gift of seeing God in front of us could be something that the cultural, religious diversity of this country has given. What did it do to me as a junior doctor? It gave me a sense of composite identity. I was very aware that the child that comes in from the Harijan colony or the colony or from tribal community did not have the same start or access like the child who comes from a family with third generation education. In my own family, I'm the fourth generation woman who has had access to education. How can I not stop looking at fellow women and fellow girls and say, this must be everybody's shared experience. Access to higher education in my generation was almost an automatic for the middle class families. It, was, it is still not so for the low income families. We have to do more. Growing up to be an equal in Nagaland meant even if I was alone, and I still find myself alone in many podiums with a whole lot of men, it's not that I feel alone. I feel that I am an equal, a product of this world, and a product of the hard work of many generations in India. I'm the first medical doctor of my family, and I'm very happy that I give back to this country as a doctor, but I'm very happy that I also continue the legacy of what Mahatma Gandhi said, uh, of leadership that touches the lives of people for the better. There was an unexpected turn. I was just 28, had finished my postgraduate studies. I lost my father. And therefore, I had to move quickly into a situation where there was responsibility to be taken for a service mandate of 108 villages, 250,000 people, and comprehensive programming that went beyond child health. Unfamiliar teams, and a leadership role that I quite not had anticipated. What did I do? I hit the refresh button, and this is something that I want to present to you in this journey of from good to, I hope, someday, to having a great experience in changing the lives of people. I returned to basics. I sat down and said, what is my vision? I have to be myself. I have to do things the way that I can, and I have to absorb from what is around me. I remembered to look around, and there were so many amazing public health pioneers who had combined the science of pediatrics and the passion of child health into the broader development framework. I went back to school. I did a fellowship and a master's in public health. We were at the School of Public Health at Harvard at the same time. I re-equipped myself. I renewed for scale. I was not used to the scale, and I rededicated myself to good quality practice what I had learned as a junior doctor, but prepared myself for things that I had to be prepared for, research and public policy. This is one of my patients uh, in the October, my young mother's clinic. My world hasn't changed much. Uh, the only change that has happened is from this mother and child unit. Today, I always ask for parents and child unit. I ask the father to be present at least for immunizations. I invite the fathers to be present for evaluations of children before school and in adolescence. This image has still stayed with me. In 2010, I had to hit the refresh button again when I founded with my dedicated team the International Center for Child and Public Health. But if you look at the poster, it was not just Shanti Ashram, that is the foundational Gandhian organization that I am part with, not only the new entity, the International Center for Child and Public Health, the first of its kind in India, but you see there were amazing five people who had that dedicated uh, commitment to, to the community. Dr. Raj Shekhar mentioned one of them, the Aravind Eye Hospital. I had PSG. I had the Avinash Lingam University. I had also a diagnostic lab that was there. All of them, pioneers in their fields, committed to society, willing to collaborate. And this is just a snapshot. The slides will be there. What we do together today. That's the power of collaboration. That's the power of scaling up. But what I want to present to you is also a constant audit of how we look at our work. And I want to bring the words of my colleague from UNICEF, the former executive director, who said children provide a sensitive viewing of how our families, communities, and governments are functioning. It's the same template that we use for our own work. 
Today, the foundation touches the lives of about 70,000 children. But in, in, uh, in five years ago, I decided that scaling up was not just increasing numbers in our institutions. We decided to put up a very dedicated partnership platform. 235 institutions are part of it. Let me conclude with these last four words. In this journey, as I said, I feel somewhere in the middle today. I feel the big word for me today is collaboration. The dissolving of the ego, but the empowerment of the collective we. Compassion to me is center stage today. My personal audit for myself is if I can look at every child and say, I see my relevance in you. Somehow it has preceded competence uh, in equal measures. No, no giving up on that high standards. The world is really our measurement for competence. I also want to see in this collaborative model who can bring what, but for that greater purpose, the health and well-being of children. A million children, I hope, will be my personal bank statement when I end my professional career. And the bigger vision will continue that every child deserves a healthy start to life. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. After having had the two fantastic lectures, it's a great pleasure for me to invite uh, Mrs. Jayantashree Jain, Balagishan. My, uh, always, I like her because of her. I have seen her in the YouTube and also in the Vain the TV when she had a very big uh, session in uh, Birdhanagar. So she's a good fan of mine. And just like Rajinikanth Superstar, she's a super speaker. May I call Mr. Jayantashree to come to the stage, please. Vanakkam. Uh, I would appreciate an echo, please. Vanakkam. Okay. Vanakkam is a Tamil word which is easily some five to six thousand years of age. And it doesn't have a season, it doesn't have a gender, it doesn't have anything. You can greet anybody with this beautiful word. Thanks a lot for the echo. And thanks a lot, uh, the organizers. If it is Ganga Hospital, I congratulate you again because. As you told, you love taking risks. You have invited me for the second time. Thank you ever so much. And the topic I have got is Ubuntu in English or Ubuntu in its native tongue. But before I get into it, uh, I should appreciate Dr. Venu for having made a mention of Dr. Ramam Ramaswamy. Uh, you were his junior colleague and he was your mentor. Thanks a lot. Now, my son was his patient, and uh, when my son was hardly a year old, I rather chose him to be a doctor. He was with Masonic also. So the doctor just gave me a beautiful advice. He said, I can treat your son, but I'm sorry I do not have any panacea for the guilty conscience of a working mother. Right? So he said, I'm sorry I cannot treat your anxiety. Um, I, am, I really wonder how relevant I am here, but one thing is, as you every day, in and out, meet parents with anxiety, you may have medicine for your patient, but certainly not patients for the parental anxiety. So I think I am the most relevant person to stand here. Thanks a lot to Dr. Rajashekaran because he gave the initiative and thanks a lot to Dr. Vinu because she could also continue in the same trend and I am here. I am a non-science person and sometimes a nonsense person too. So this is an anticipatory bail for Ubuntu. Ubuntu just means I am because we are or I am because you are. I, I really do not know how many of us understand the philosophy behind it. After the, I mean, during the post apartheid, it, this word uh, gained currency. Many people started using it, including Archbishop Desmond Tutu. 
when he said this is exactly how we have to look at the people who uh, colonized us, who ill-treated us. And his book so beautifully puts it, no future without forgiveness. Ubuntu was again a word which was used by the former president of US, Barack Obama, in 2018 when he addressed an audience in Johannesburg on, of course, Nelson Mandela. He said Nelson Mandela happens to be the right kind of person who practiced Ubuntu so totally, so convincingly, so completely. And I took it as uh, my word today, and that's exactly what we may have to help people around us to learn. Mahatma Gandhi practiced it, Mother Teresa practiced it. Any person who took the form of a human being, any soul that came down here, always had this in its mind, Ubuntu, I am because we are. No, no problem is an individual problem. It's a collective problem projected individually. Now, that's what I personally believe as a teacher. I start with a little story. Maybe I'll carry on with a couple of stories also. There's a little kid who is playing there in the early morning in a seashore. And a senior citizen happens to be there on the beach for a morning walk. The little boy happens to be collecting something very preciously, getting back to the waves, throwing it there, and coming back again and seriously collecting. Uh, the senior citizen, this old person, takes some time to watch what exactly this little boy is busy doing. And he finds that the complete seashore is covered with thousands and thousands of uh, starfish which have been washed ashore for no reason. This little boy seems to be very anxious, very panic-stricken. He so much wants to save every one of them. He collects them, throws them back, and comes again to collect a few more. This old person just goes and stands near the little boy and says, what difference is it going to make? Right? You're not going to save everything. You cannot. And why do you do? It's such a futile attempt. It looks as if, as a senior person, he's able to drive home some kind of a common sense, within quotation, so that the child may understand the futility of the whole assignment. But the little boy just turns around, looks deep into the eyes of the senior person and says, Maybe, but it would certainly make a difference to the little starfish which I have already thrown into the sea. Now, this is exactly the message of Ubuntu. That's what Dr. Rajashekaran and Dr. Vinu made a mention of. Now, it, it seems to be a coincidence, it seems to be destiny, but I do not know. I'm happy about how things fall into their place. Now, this is what we may have to tell our children. Now, unfortunately, we have started providing our children with an unhealthy kind of comfort zone, again within quotation. As a teacher, I have been watching this. Children get everything even before they ask for. They don't wait for anything. They don't long for anything. They don't work for anything. As a result of which, they have completely lost the sensitivity towards a society which waits for something, which longs for something, which cries for something. They walk past that particular society even without sparing a glance at them, plainly because the senior generation or their parents have trained them to remain insensitive to certain pathetic situations of life. And as a teacher, I have come upon students who have just a breakfast or a dinner. They can't afford three meals a day. And a mere question whether they had a breakfast is enough to make them break down. They sit and sob their hearts out because their father happens to be an alcoholic, mother is a chronic patient, and they, have, they do not have a kind of an ambience which is conducive for a young mind to grow. At this particular juncture, I would like to again make a reference to a beautiful book I came upon, at least according to me, it's a very beautiful book because anything that makes me different after I complete the book, and if the book continues to keep influencing my thoughts, then it has to be a beautiful book, all in capital letters, put well within quotation. If possible, you can highlight it with underlining it also. Now, this particular book is written by Bruce Lipton, a microbiologist. You might have come upon that particular book. The title of the book is The Biology of Belief. The, the very title was so striking. It just repeatedly states 
that if a child has to have good qualities once again socially acceptable productive proactive qualities the child has to necessarily be tutored all these when the child's brain is in a kind of it's not consolidated it's still in a flux it's still fluid anything can be imprinted upon it well within seven years that's exactly when you learn your alphabet that's where you learn your tables that's where you learn your good manners and because the mind is in a plastic state that anything can be imprinted there but once you become an adult maybe that's a juncture when you get adulterated also you get you grow into an adult and if you really want to change everything that has gone into your subconscious level it becomes very difficult because subconscious is an autopilot whenever your conscious level takes back seat even without your summoning you automatically the autopilot takes and you are a slave of the habits you have formed well within your seventh year if that is a case as an adult if you want to eradicate all those things then you have to either go to uh, for go i mean you have to be put on hypnosis or it has to be repetition it's a very beautiful book because it repeatedly tells us or at least i could hear something which i've already heard from my puranas which are prevalent in india it talks about an abhimanyu who learned so many things when he was in his mother's womb or a praklada who learned so many things when he was in his mother's womb or even lord krishna with all his great qualities his kindness his magnificent consideration for everyone grew up as a little boy so that he can kill his uncle and the reason behind that happens to be his mother devaki stay in the prison where every day every day she has to think of when exactly her brother will come to snatch away the little baby so it all starts parenting starts even when the child is in the form of a fetus in the womb it's a brilliant book now coming back to my ubuntu i am because we are a kind of a message which we have to take home we have to drive home rather to the psyche of the child telling that you are not an empowered person you are after all an entitled child most of the children or even women mistake entitlement for empowerment i am an entitled woman because somebody worked for me and gave it all to me because i now i can stand before you all and address an audience an august audience for that somebody worked for me as dr vinu so beautifully put it i am the fourth generation uh, learner of my family and i am a doctor and all she could stand on the pedestal that has been created by the hard work of somebody else if that is the case my child has to understand getting itself empowered is different from being an entitled individual who is enjoying whatever has been given to it by the society without realizing that it has got to give it back to the society i have got my own share to be given back to the society i have got a little boy here who should be around 18 or 19 who had a very humble origin for his start he lost his father when he was hardly 5 years old and his mother really wanted to take him off the school but fortunately for him his primary school teacher a language teacher his tamil teacher could encourage him and could fund him and now the boy has been representing the school in sprinting short distance running the boy has become so popular and he has been he could come out of the school he could represent the college he could represent the university he could represent the state now he is representing the country okay fine now the boy comes back to the school to thank all those people who are responsible for this greatness and he even challenges everyone that he could run and show them how he can clock well within the given time the world record everybody stands up gives him a standing ovation a bouquet is presented a shawl is given to him excepting the little teacher who really helped him to grow into what he is now the teacher says i do not want you to run a race all alone i want you to run a race along with two people we'll see how well you run the race the teacher brings a person who is easily 70 plus and a woman who is visually challenged and the teacher says why not you run the race along with these two people the distance the boy could cover well within 10 seconds now takes more than 10 minutes for him because he has to help these people guide these people and he has to go along with them 
And now when they reach the goal, the whole village or the whole school, they just look at this boy, but the teacher alone starts clapping. He says, you got your education not to run a race all alone. You got your, run a got your education so that you can take along with you people who cannot be as quick as you are, as fast as you are. This is Ubuntu. This is Ubuntu. Thanks a lot. Now, I should tell you, I'm, I'm a government school product. I'm a loan scholarship person. Indian government gave me loan scholarship, insisting that every month I have to, I mean, every year I have to send an annual progress report. And it also told me one thing. Once you become a teacher and continue being a teacher for 10 years, you need not repay the loan. I did not become a teacher for that. After becoming a teacher, when I came to know of it, I thought I should pay back the loan with interest every day. It keeps multiplying by telling people, Ubuntu, come on, I am what I am. Thanks a lot for what you are. I have got a little anecdote before I conclude. It's about a fighter pilot. Every time he takes off the flight, right? And it's, he's extremely adventurous, and people are awestricken when he maneuvers with that flight. And one day, it was very, very critical, and uh, the f plane may crash land. At that point, he could successfully eject the parachute and had a, he could have a safe landing. People appreciate him. People appreciate his good fortune. Everything is so beautiful. After a couple of years, he comes upon a person in a wayside restaurant, and the person comes, sits near him, and asks how he is, and talks about little details which only a fighter pilot can understand. This pilot is really taken aback, and he asks that man, who are you? How come you know all this? Smilingly, the other person said, I'm after all a mechanic who works with a fighter pilot. Your flights, right? And every time you take off in the flight, I see to that your parachute is kept ready. And you might not have seen me at all. You might not even have spared me a smile. Now the fighter pilot is extremely thankful because there was a parachute and it was in a condition to open at the right moment and give him, though not a soft landing, at least a safe landing. Ubuntu is talking about how many of us realize that we are provided with emotional parachutes whenever we need, supportive parachutes, economic parachutes, intellectual parachutes. When we go up and get stuck at a particular point, turn around and see somebody has packed your parachute and has also taken care that you have a soft landing and a safe landing. This is Ubuntu. And see whether you can pack the parachute for somebody so that when they go up and there is some kind of a problem, you may be there helping them to land peacefully, perfectly, and happily. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, we've had uh, three very inspiring talks, and we're lucky we've got about uh, five to ten minutes for discussion, comments, any, any thoughts from the audience. Anybody wants to come up and, and I guess while people are gathering their thoughts, maybe I'll ask all three speakers. You know, I, I sort of see a common theme between all three speakers, which is, you know, sort of pride in your origins and still humility. So how do you sort of carry that on and how do you mentor juniors, family, you know, junior colleagues, students, any sort of take home points? We'll start with Dr. Raj Sekhar. So that's why I dread these question answer sessions. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you talked of uh, modesty and humility. I think uh, uh, I like a quote very much. And this was actually uh, told to me many years before by Mohit Bandari, whom all of us know. So we both were the co-plenary speakers in uh, Royal College in London, and then we were discussing on... He said, if you, are the, if you are in a room where you are the most learned person, then you are in a wrong room. He said, don't be in a place where you are the top. And that will fill you up with lots of strange, funny ideas in your head. So you have to move quickly to a room where everybody there is better than you. 
and uh, luckily god given i think most of the successful people are and who still have a balance in the head are people who have had been in the right place and still maintain the opportunity to be rubbing shoulders with people who are much much better than them and when you are in this situation you know that you are a small speck in this big world and then that's i mean you can't be high headed after that but vinu has a right to become i think so no <laughs> no i think very simple those of us uh, who work with children they don't do what we say uh, they do what they see um and so for me example has become paramount uh, if i want something i live it uh, and it's very hard uh, what we're telling them to do so one is example and i have found that powerful professor m s swaminath and dr ramaswamy my own father was on the first batch of fulbright scholars from india um and uh, 30 40 years after he finished his phd in the us he had the chance to meet einstein education psychology was his work the the energy with which he presented that it was a little bit like watching the previous panel you know the dialogue between the orthopedicians the pediatricians that enthusiasm was very infectious so example um infectious enthusiasm for me also breeds humility the third thing is what dr archeker said um you know as we get busy there's the danger of also speaking more so consciously um in the last 5 years uh, every week i go out to meet someone who makes a difference to children not just child health uh, so i have gone to arvind i've gone to uh, the noon meal center so i go where i don't have to speak and i learn and i think uh, that's something that uh, to to shut up is also something that that i find helps tremendously to be humble don't blah blah all the time exactly huh? <laughs> exactly exactly thank you uh maybe ubuntu again i am what i am thanks a lot to my students i am what i am thanks a lot to people around me you know most often i find i am i'm humbled plainly because others are so simple so down to earth so practical and you as uh, vinu said she learns from people people help me to unlearn many things what i have wrongly learned that's it thank you thank you so much well who's got a comment wonderful mm. wonderful thoughts uh, thank you so much um is it possible for someone who doesn't feel like they're a speck in the ocean someone who feels that they are on top of the ocean on top of the world think they know everything and don't recognize those that have helped them um is it possible to change that person yeah um uh, can i take that yes yes uh, i i the reason i presented when i was you know dr raj shekar called me about 6 weeks ago for this talk and you know the the most important thing there was the relationship with my ego you know the first phase of my career was about external validation and some people tend to linger in that they have to be we know many in our profession who know that you know the grand rounds it's not hierarchy it's just you know blind spot uh, to do this so i feel i feel if uh, if they have a impact on society we still have to have them on the table and they have to be helped i think by people around patience patience but i don't think they will be able to make the kind of change they can if they don't go beyond that so they could still have value the value might still be there but what could have been the real value might might not have been fully achieved i don't know if if, if that makes sense okay so two final questions sandeep yeah. and then uh, raj sandeep um, yeah i'm sorry i'm sorry no if yeah. i take the question i would rather give the person a second chance a third chance because there is every chance of my going wrong uh, the way i look at the person the way i assess i assess a person so instead of being judgmental i would always give the person another chance that's it and i will also protect myself from becoming another person like the person whom i am trying to correct mm. good okay okay yeah. uh, thanks for the lovely talk uh, professor archikar one question do you believe it's possible for men with intellect and hard work to turn into institutions by themselves by mentoring rather than a building 
because everybody may not be able to construct or create infrastructure and empower others, but they can still become institutions by themselves. Is it possible? Exactly. So, uh, you are absolutely right, Sadeep, because uh, an institution is not something that has to be in brick, cement and mortar. Like uh, Dr. Ram Sami, and there are two great pediatricians in this uh, city. I always feel so bad that they are not recognized internationally. I tell this all the time in our uh, hospital. They are people who are thousand times better than the current people in Coimbatore who are recognized, but they have been this. Both Dr. Ravi Kumar and Dr. Uh, Ramaswamy are two people who have been the cause for many other institutions coming up. Both of them have not built an institution in cement and mortar, but they have been the reason for many of the institutions coming up in Coimbatore, like Shanti Ashram, I mean, maybe Ganga Hospital, maybe many other institutions have come up because of them. So you can power an institution by what is most important is the human mind, which is the most important. It's the human mind which makes things happen. So if you have mentored another person to do what needs to be done, and that is possible not just in one institution, you can make 100 people, you can mentor 100 people, then you have done more than what uh, you have done. What did Gandhiji do? He didn't build an institution. He just powered a movement. Yeah. I just uh, have... can I yes, just please, add please, to it? please. I think it's important that we look at it like that. Uh, some build in institutions in brick and mortar and some build people um, uh, to do it and I think uh, this, this, this world today also requires sessions like this to look back. So one of the things as students we are doing um, uh, for Dr. Amsami is this, this whole year he, he sat down and wrote uh, his own story. And we are hoping to put a course in public health practice uh, around pediatrics where we can retrieve this. I mean, when there was nothing, he was not, he was, he, he could not rent a room for pediatric practice in this city because diarrheal patients would be there. No doctor can even think of it like that. Mm. Uh, and he also speaks about how, what are the skills he came, brought back from the United States and what are the things here. So we also need to go back. Uh, and as Dr. Rajshekhan said, I think it's important also to present different leadership models um, uh, and, and look at those leadership models as examples that we can connect to. One of the things that is spoken about is evolutionary leadership, just like transformational leadership. And evolutionary leadership is when by individual excellence or individual example or individual giving, you actually change the benchmarks in that profession. Um, I was whispering to Sanjeev and to, um, uh, to Dr. Raj Shekran, one of the most moving stories in President Mandela's life was the march that was organized by Archbishop Tutu when President Mandela came out of the prison, that defining image of freedom and fight against apartheid. So just, just to say these, these lateral. Uh, Sanjeev? I, I'm sorry, actually, Samraj is here. I, I just yeah. would like to extend mm -hmm. on this. Um, because each the question leads on to the answer. Uh, American great philosopher, American philosopher Emerson so beautifully put it, what is an institution but a lengthened shadow of an individual? What is history but the biography of few stout tall people? Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one question, Samaraju. I'm sorry, Ramni. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you for three great uh, inspiring lectures. All three are about talking about giving back to society and giving back to our brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm talking on behalf of the youngsters. When I was a youngster, my greatest problem was insecurity. So we always think that uh, if I keep giving, I have to worry about my law and cloth at some day. So I want you to give a practical tip for the youngsters, how to balance between this give and take so that they don't need to worry about the law and cloth. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's not uh, actually give and take as a compromise because as a doctor when you are uh, practicing you are always taking. I mean there is no doubt about that. 
and there is no doctor who is so poor that he cannot do 10% of his uh, practice at a subsidized rate if not free. So actually when I was the president of the Indian Orthopedic Association, we started the Give Back to the Society uh, project. In the banquet dinner, I asked uh, this question, which one of us here is so poor that he cannot operate one case totally free in a year? You know, there's nobody. But although we agree on that broad philosophy, when there is a single patient in front of you who needs a free surgery, our mind starts dingle dangling. So it is just that you need to be focused that every one of us have more than what we want. Every one of us, there's no doubt about it, that we have more than what we really require. And we didn't start this project of uh, giving back after we reached a certain level of, uh, what can I say, prosperity. But it was started on the day that we started our practice. Within the first six months of us starting the practice, we started Project Helpline. It was because I was actually trained as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon when I was in UK and I was in the Alder Hay Children Hospital and we used to do the foot clinic over there. And we used to have 40 patients of which 20 didn't have any problem at all. Another 10 had some small problems and one was this curling up deformity of the little finger, uh, little toe. And there was such a lot of problem about this, we have to write a letter to the school teacher, to the child psychologist, to the father who had no time to come and all that. And my mind always used to go back to Madras Medical College from where I came a few months before, people with horrendous deformities. And we used to say, okay, you don't have pain, so nothing needs to be done. We didn't think of the cosmetic effect, we didn't think of the psychological effect. And it was always working in my mind, so when we came back first, when Dr. Ram Sami asked me once to see a child in Masonic Hospital, yeah, Vinod was there, that's how we got to know each other. And uh, patient can't afford, so Dr. Ram Sami and Ravi Kumar used to say, take it out of your equation of treatment. Do what you need to do for the patient. And then, even at the first time we started, we started Project Helpline. And you don't need to be thinking about how much I can take before I need to give. If you give quite a lot, God gives you back quite, quite, quite a lot. So I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think that's, those are great words to finish after uh, Dr. Vinu yeah. finishes with I, her comments. I just, I feel what you value in yourself and what society needs from you, they, it has to meet. You can't give what you don't have and you must give what the society needs. So as a junior doctor, all I gave back was being a good doctor. I gave time and off my free time, I found a portion of my time to volunteer. So today, volunteering is studied as a science. You know, just like a professor spoke about the big, the, the, the big guys with the big heads completely absorbed with themselves. Volunteering is an afterthought. Mm. I think our own vocations give us great spaces to be volunteers, to be a mentor. So practically three things, I think. See what you have as your gifts. And that's a great uh, self-assessment to do. See what society needs, make the link. I think the, the famous saint from St. Francis, a great inspiration to Mahatma Gandhi, St. Francis said, it is in giving that we receive. And maybe uh, most of us, when you start thinking of giving, you think you are a money donor. You can also be a time donor. Now that's the best form of giving, be a time donor. Thank you. I think this, is, this has been a very great, inspiring, and a very different, unique session. And I hope Posey does things like this in the future meetings too. Thank you so much for this session. Great. Thomas. When could we leave them? We leave the program. I don't have the program. So, as usual, you know, orthopedic oncology falls 
in the end, even after we had a validatory function, but still we are important. I'm going to start the first talk with Dr. Thomas Polikrin speaking on approach to a child with a lesion around the knee. Thomas, I've got a flight to catch in the next hour or so, so I hope we all stick to time. There yeah. you go. So after a very humbling and inspiring talk by the previous three people, Dr. Binu Aram, Ubuntu, I learned a new word, Ubuntu, and from Dr. Raj Shekran. I also come from an institution which is over 120 years old. And it's good to go for another 80 years, I think, and another legacy of Dr. Paul Brand and Dr. M. V. Daniel, who actually took voluntary retirement and who's Dr. Brisha's mentor, came here to Ganga and actually helped start that academic. So we played a small part in the growth of Ganga. Okay, so my talk today is on approach to the child with How do you move the slides? Sorry. So the treatment should be adapted to char the characteristics of each patient. So you have to localize the tumor, you have to look for the size of the tumor, stage the tumor, and ponder about the therapeutic possibilities based on the age of the patient. And the imaging information is key in determining the nature and extent of tumors. So the challenges in doing tumors in children are of course the small size, the growth potential you have to take into account, and the need for durable reconstruction. And of course in our country, there are many constraints of implant, finance, the paucity of bone banks, of grafting material. So I'll quickly go through some of the basics. So benign tumors can be classified into latent, active, and aggressive. Latent are static, self-limiting, active grows over time, limited by tissue barriers, and aggressive are those which are locally invasive, often erodes the cortex. Now that's an example of a benign lesion, but in the epiphysis of a growing child, can just about make a loosened area there, but on an MR, looks fairly big. So that's what the MR does. On multiplanar imaging, it actually gives you a lot of information. And that's per op, where we actually uh, made a lattice work, curated it out, and put artificial bone graft. And that's a one-year follow-up. So a benign tumor around the knee, chondroblastoma. So malignant, coming to malignant tumors, they're staged by the histological grade, the anatomical extent, whether it's intra-compartmental or extra-compartmental, and the need to evaluate for a biopsy. The biopsy is very important. So the biopsy is usually a core biopsy, core needle trifine biopsy if for musculoskeletal tumors. We shouldn't do FNACs. And it's performed through an involved compartment. And all the rules of biopsy it should be in line with the incision. Meticulous hemostasis when open biopsy is done and the drain should be brought out of the skin in line with the incision. So imaging, routine radiographic imaging, the, the Lordwick's classification, the good old Lordwick's classification where you classify them into geographic, moth-eaten, and permeative for the sock. Now the matrix is something that you should also look at, whether it's an osteoid matrix or a chondroid matrix, and gives you clues whether it's an osteogenic tumor or a chondrogenic tumor. So coming to imaging, uh, we do chest radiographs, bone scan uh, in a small center, and you can also, if you have the chest CT, which is more sensitive, do a chest CT. And nowadays, a lot of people prefer to do a PET scan. Before we didn't have the PET scan, we used to do just a chest, uh, chest CT, ultrasound abdomen, and bone scan. But uh, nowadays, a lot of people use PET and that, that uses the T2-deoxyglucose, and it correlates well with histopathological grading. But the, but the imaging is paramount. I think multiplanar imaging, both on all these three planes, sagittal, coronal, and axial, to tell you of the extent of the tumor and re the def defining relationship, which helps you plan your surgery, and information about how proximal, pro its proximity to the physial plate and giving you measurements at where your anticipated margins are paramount, very important. 
And then finally, you tailor your treatment by looking at the location, the size of the lesion, you stage the tumor, and, and you uh, plan your surgery. We'll just run through some examples. This I've, I've shown, uh, it's an Ewing sarcoma child, nine-year-old boy with an proximal tibia. That's what we did, we resected the tumor. But you have to be careful of the blood vessel posteriorly. And we actually uh, downturned the patella, attached it, and then took the fibula across, and we reconstructed with this. And this is a two-year follow-up with reasonable range of movement at the knee, around 70 to 80 degrees. Now, this is a child with osteosarcoma. See the permeative run, uh, sunburst appearance. And on the MR, what looks very innocuous on the radiograph actually looks big, crossing the physal plate, going up to the knee. And that's what we did. We did a long segment resection, wide resection, used a vascular fibula graft, bridged it with a plate. And this, this was one of our best cases. When eight year follow up for an osteosarcoma is not usual. So he's going on to college now, he's doing well. And as I said in my last talk, for every one of these osteosarcomas which is doing well, three or four of them actually die. And when, you, when you're a tumor surgeon, you actually, uh, there are a lot of ups and downs. So this is another operation which is, uh, which is actually done better than a lot of reconstruction. This was described by Borgreave for TB in the 30s. In the 50s, Van Ness did it for uh, congenital limb uh, anomalies. In the 70s, it was started being used for tumors. And it's an effective knee joint, provides an effective knee joint and a viable alternative to AK amputation. So this is a child with a malignant distal femur tumor. That's what we did. It's quite, a, uh, um, quite an operation with a lot of blood loss. So you resect the whole thing, make sure the vessels and the tibial nerve are intact. That's a resected portion. Then you do an osteosynthesis, turn the leg around 180 degrees with the foot, with the foot attached. And you can see him walking. Hopefully this will play, I'm sorry. Yeah, fairly good result. And we are very happy with the rotation plasty, with the function which is equal, if not better than many of our reconstruction options actually. But in our country, in our culture, they sometimes don't accept the leg and the foot turning back. Even if we show this video to many, of the parents, they don't accept rotation plasty. But it gives fantastic results. I think it's even better than some reconstructions that we've done. So rotation plasty is another option. So the newer surgical techniques, the advent of better agents have brought about success and from 30% five year survival, we've almost crossed or reached 70% five year survival. And from preserving life, we've gone on to preserving the limb and its function. So that's the team. All three of us do tumors, and in difficult cases, we, we help each other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, we'll have the question in the end. You can join us over here on the stage. So the next lecture is by Dr. Venkatesh Sampat Kumar. He's going to speak on osteochondromas. When do I intervene? Uh, thank you, Dr. Shah Alam, sir, and Dr. Venkat for inviting me to this August audience. So this afternoon, I'm going to talk on when do I intervene an osteochondroma. So uh, my disclosures, I'm not, I, I'm not an exclusive pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and I do a lot of oncology work. So uh, rather than asking when will I intervene, I would like to ask when will I not intervene an osteochondroma. Say we have an uh, eight-year-old eight year girl uh, with an osteochondroma, which is sessile of the proximal humerus, or we have a 10-year-old boy with an osteochondroma of the distal fibula, uh, uh, di distal tibia, which is uh, uh, deforming the fibula, or uh, we have a hereditary multiple exhaustosis patient with a genu valgum, or we have this pedunculated osteochondroma in a skeletally mature child of around 18 years. 
So, when will I not? To answer this, I would first have a brief look at the pathogenesis of osteochondroma. We are all aware of the groove of Ranvier and where some cells, instead of uh, growing in the longitudinal direction, they start growing horizontally and that's why we have an osteochondroma. Typically, the medullary canal grows into the osteochondroma and there is a cartilage cap to the osteochondroma. So, why does it happen? This happens because the perichondrial cells, which usually have a polarity, they lose their polarity, probably because there is a problem with the EXT gene here. So the EXT gene, when we lost the function of the EXT gene, there is reduction in heparin sulfate, leading to increased BMP signaling. So when there is increased BMP signaling, the polarity is lost, and the osteochondroma, and that's why we get an osteo osteochondroma. So when these uh, uh, bones, uh, when, when the osteochondromas start growing, they try to push at everything that comes in the way. And sorry. So uh, here you can see the osteochondroma of the distal tibia, which is uh, deforming the fibula, leading to a, var a varus at the ankle. And here you can see the osteochondroma, which is, uh, uh, sorry, the previous one, uh, which is causing a, a vascular compression. And then we have the osteochondroma of the spinal column, which is causing spinal cord compression. So the must, first most important thing is when the osteochondroma causes pressure effect, then I will have to intervene. So of all these four options, the pressure effect to me is happening in here. So how would I intervene? I would do uh, extra periosteal excision. I would make drill holes to the base, ensure that I take the uh, base of the osteochondroma thoroughly along with the periosteum which is diseased and I do this kind of an excision here. And after I do an excision, I assess the stability of the bone. And if, if, if I think there is a high, high chance of pathological fracture, I might add a plate. So another thing, important thing about osteochondroma is when they start growing uh, in the different direction, they also take some cells along with them, leading to growth disturbances. For example, this is well studied in the hereditary multiple exostosis, where we can see that if you have an osteochondroma in the distal part of the ulna, uh, the ulna actually acts as a tether and tries to deform the radius, finally leading to radial head dislocation. So, and we have had a beautiful talk this morning on how to correct this. So, we all know the mesodietal classification of how growth disturbance caused by an osteochondroma can cause elbow and forearm deformities, and we have treatment available for this. So, of all the four options here, the growth disturbance is probably caused by this, so leading to a genu valgum in here. So how will I intervene? The traditional way I do, I used a growth modulation plate technique here. Of course, I know that these are sick viruses, and sometimes we may not get the desirable results, but of course we can correct these deformities in skeletal maturity. And the third important indication is pain. So pain in osteochondroma can be due to a pathological, uh, due to a fracture of the stalk, or it can be due to bursitis. So uh, sometimes these osteochondromas can be like a rose thorn here, and this can lead to persistent bursitis, which we have published in a case report. So femoral osteoexhaustosis, they cause vastus medialis pain, especially when they are on the medial part, and they lead to bursitis, which will result in significant pain for the patient that affects their activity of daily living. So in those conditions as well, we need to excise the osteochondromas. And so if you look at these four options, the third option is also gone. So by ruling out, we might think that this is the uh, case where we actually do not need to intervene. But as I said in my disclosure, I'm not a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and I work, do a lot of oncology work. So we must, uh, I must talk some oncology. See this osteochondroma in here. So the, what, uh, what, what you can see here, there's a small depression in here. That's because this is an, a recurrent osteochondroma, which happens in a previously excised site. So, and moreover, when you look at the cartilage cap, the cartilage cap here is very thick. And when you look at the axial sections, actually what you can see, that the osteochondroma is engulfing almost 75% of the circumference of the, uh, uh, circumference of the humerus here. So this is a case which I would treat like a chondrosarcoma conversion in an osteochondroma. So I would excise this tumor based upon oncological principles, and I would reconstruct it with multiple ways which we can use here. I had used a nail cement plate spacer, but there are various ways of reconstructing an osteochondroma uh, uh, for an intercalary resection. 
So what is the risk of malignant transformation in an osteochondroma? Does all the osteochondromas convert to chondrosarcomas? No. The risk is actually less if it was a pedunculated solitary osteochondroma, roughly 1 to 2 percent. Again, it is very difficult to gauge this risk because a lot of pedunculated solitary osteochondromas might not even present to the doctor because they might not have any symptoms at all. So this is actually a presumed risk. The sessile osteochondromas have a slightly more risk than the pedunculated ones. Of course, the genetic osteochondromas, the hereditary multiple exostosis, they have a lifetime risk of uh, osteochondroma conversion close up to 25%. So what should we look for while looking for a malignant transformation? Look for recurrent tumors, irregular mineralization within the cartilage cap, and thickness of the cartilage cap more than 15 millimeters. So beware of an osteochondroma that grows rapidly, especially after skeletal maturity. So the last option is also gone. As you can see here, the osteochondroma has got a thick cartilage cap, which is more than 15 millimeter as measured in the MRI scans. So the answer to my question is actually none of the below. The way I treat an osteochondroma will be different in each of these different patients. But we should all understand, appreciate that the reason for treating them is what is more important. But will I keep doing it all the time? Uh, what should I avoid is this. We should, we, whenever we remove an osteochondroma, we should try to uh, remove it in one full uh, piece and should not do a piecemeal excision. So what are the future directions? Does the future hold some promise? Can we avoid surgeries in the future? We, have, we all had a great talk this morning from the genetists that there is a new drug called paloveritin, which is actually going to help us in the future. So what, how does it affect? As I said, there is a reduction in heparin sulfate uh, due to reduced uh, signaling from the EXT gene and uh, leading to increased BMP signaling. Paloveritin, it's a retinoic acid uh, analog which is going to act on the retinoic acid receptor and it is going to inhibit this BMP signaling leading to uh, uh, decreased osteochondroma formation. This drug is being used for, uh, uh, tested for hereditary multiple exostosis, and in fact, the drug was initially so promising that Ibsen actually acquired uh, the whole company, Clementia, just for the single drug. But unfortunately, every story does not have a happy ending, and Ibsen landed with this uh, recent FDA clinical hold because uh, this paloveritin was found to cause uh, early skeletal growth arrest in some of the children. So, my take-home message, solitary uncomplicated osteochondromas can be safely observed, but again, we need to keep them under our radar, ensure that they are not growing, and ensure they are not becoming any painful. So, remember LMNOP, look for malignant transformation, neurovascular compression, oddness, I mean deformity, shortenings, joint dislocations, and pain. If you have any of these, then probably you should intervene. Tailor the treatment to your patient, again, follow the principles of management depending upon what exactly the treatment method you have chosen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Venkateshan, for that uh, very elaborate talk on osteochondroma. Uh, we'll next invite Dr. Ashish Gulia for tumor mimics, the rules of the game. Dr. Gulia is from a premier institute, Tata Memorial Institute in Bombay. He is the secretary of the Indian Musculoskeletal Oncological Society of India. And I invite him to give his talk. Thank you, Thomas and Shah, for uh, the kind introduction. And thanks to POSI for inviting me here to share our experience. Uh, greetings from Tata Memorial Hospital. Uh, <clears throat> Venkat was very clear that I need to talk something which I am not very comfortable with. I would have been very nice talking about some malignant or benign bone tumor, but he said that you need to pull out your cases where you have not done much, and then let's see what rules you can set by uh, looking at the tumor mimics. And I went through all, 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 all our cases and uh, find some, and I realized there are no set rules for tumor mimics, and every tumor or every lesion of these kinds behave in a different way. But what I can help here is that I can give some guidelines which can help a pediatric orthopedic surgeon or a general orthopedic surgeon where they can differentiate these tumor mimics from malignant or benign bone tumors. First and foremost is very important is that we need to look at the clinical course of the disease. This can help us in differentiating lots of tumor mimics from malignant or benign tumors. Obviously, we need to look at the symptoms, whether there was any 
preceding trauma or not, and any constitutional symptoms are also there or not. Do not hesitate to image these lesions more and you know because additional three-dimensional imaging in the form of CT scan or MRI which is gold standard can help you to clinch diagnosis in many of these investigations and it can really be helpful. The dictum and the most important thing if you plan to intervene in any ways please ensure that you have a histopathological confirmation done before taking on to any any sort of treatment and this will help you not to safeguard the interest of the patients but in today's era of medical legal issues it will safeguard you as well. And worse than the last, in, 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 in the developing countries like us where infections are very prevalent, you need to make sure that you do cultures of all your biopsies that can also help you to clinch diagnosis. So when we look at non-tumorous lesions, we can actually cat categorize or divide them into traumatic, reparative, infective, metabolic, cystic, and some unexpected pathologies. I could have given you the classification further, but I thought it would just take away the interest from the talk. And let's see some interesting cases and how we go further. Cases can be as simple as this, where a 15-year-old boy came to you. He, he has a growing skeleton, and you see some swellings coming up. He says there's a swelling which is painful. And as Venkat just showed you, these can be osteochondromas, which usually grow along with the growth spurt. So these, can, these are not real tumors which, which sort of uh, uh, put problems to you and you need not embark on a, on a surgical excision at this stage, but you can actually wait till the skeletal maturity, assess the symptoms and then we can decide. Things can be simpler like this patient, a 30 year old male who had actually pain in the hip and when the x-ray was done, there was osteosclerotic lesion, which was actually an incidental finding. And somebody said, oh, in this age, it may be a chondrosarcoma or osteosarcoma. And then, and then it, uh, there was a panic. And uh, this patient underwent a little CT guide by a little biopsy, which was reviewed at Tata Memorial Hospital. And actually, it came out to be a bone island, which need not require any treatment as such. We go further and try to assess some more patients. And typical example is here is 40 year old male who had a pain in the knee. Again, he had pain in the knee, but when the x-ray was taken, there was some indulation and thickening of the cortex of the distal femur. And obviously there was a worry of osteosarcoma, which has a bimodal peak in, in that time. And then MRI was done where you can see a lesion, which is there in the, okay. You have a lesion, which is there in, in the medullary canal. And then, it's okay. So <clears throat> you have a lesion in the middle canal, which is very well demarcated. There's not much edema, which you can see, whether on T1 or T2. Even the contrast picture doesn't show much of the, much of the edema. And yeah, great, thanks. Much of the edema. And then, and then you see this serpentious type of thing which is which is incidentally picked up on MRI and even even not expert radiologists may call it as low-grade chondrosarcoma but actually you know that these lesions which are incidental pickups are bone infarcts and they do not require any further treatment <laughs> things may not remain as simple and you may get a patient like I got about three four years back when this 19 year old female came to me and uh, she actually presented with a history of fall and this x-ray was again done earlier and uh, we, we found a lesion in the proximal radius. She was not really symptomatic and then there was a debate about what should be the differential diagnosis, whether it's fibrous dysplasia or it's a Ewing sarcoma or, or it's a you know, uh, unicameral bone cyst or, or there's some other lesions, whether to, uh, there was debate between the MRI <coughs> doing or not. But then after evaluation, MRI was done, it came out to be a, a fibrous dysplasia and then she was treated with a single injection of zolendronic acid and there's a four-year follow-up that patient was completely healed and that's how it was sorted. Another girl, nine years old, much bigger swelling, looks cystic. On MRI, it had some reparative tissue growing. At this age, very worrisome, and especially you as an orthopedic surgeon when get a report which talks about eosinophilic granuloma, which should not be, but a round cell tumor, again worrying you, obviously you are really worried, but if you do a biopsy, which clearly says that it's a fibrous dysplasia, which had some cystic changes and reparative tissue after fracture. So these are the lesions which can really confuse you and you need to do proper imaging to establish. 
the uh, diagnosis. Let's look at this case, 12-year-old male who was presented with a history of pain in July 2012, and this kid, and this kid had this lesion in his right uh, upper femur. This patient was considered to be a patient of tuberculosis and put was an ATT. After a period of about six months, that was the condition. Doctor thought, let me take a CT scan to assess the healing post-infection and after ATT. And they thought that we need to do some correction. I don't know what sort of correction was done. And this is what was done in March 2013. And he presented in August 2013 to me with this condition. And obviously, the clinical picture is not very good. And obviously, when we get such pictures, we make a diagnosis by doing a biopsy, which came out to be a prolific osteosarcoma. And then you need to understand that even a simpler looking cases of infection can get misled and they can have confusions with sarcomas as well. A similar case, 11 year old boy had pain in the humerus, lesion in the epiphysis on the lateral aspect, CT scan done which showed some cystic areas, some edema, this, these were the MRI pictures. At the same point of time a CT scan was also done which showed some peripheral placed nodules. It was diagnosed to be a tuberculosis. Again, patient was started on ATT. Two months after initiation of ATT, <coughs> the lesion grew. Patient was worried, even doctor was. MRI was done, which showed an increase in the lesion, which went now crossing the physis into the metaphysis with the soft tissue component. These are more pictures. Again, a CT scan repeated, florid lesions considered to be osteosarcoma with bilateral pulmonary metastasis and palliative care. And this is the time when he came to Tata Memorial Hospital and before declaring the him palliative care, we did a lung biopsy which shows granulomas and it turned out to be <coughs> tuberculosis. So what I'm, what I'm trying to show you that infections can really mimic these, uh, any, any bone tumors and we need to be very, very certain. Another case where a uh, patient had a progressive pain and, uh, and uh, tenderness. And what is important here is to see that if you get a T1 weighted image, and if you get this <coughs> uh, intermittent fat suppress in, in, in this image, this is somewhere diagnostic of a superative infection, and this has really helped us. So if you are confusing <coughs> with the case of infection, please always biopsy. There are simpler things as well. So these were a bit complicated, and when we look at uh, simpler things like trauma, you can get stress fractures, which was confirmed on the MRI, and this was dealt only with rest. You can also get injuries like this, which looks very worrisome at presentation, like this boy who had history of trauma and some massage, but we all know that we need to keep myositis ossificans into mind when we deal such, uh, with these lesions and that's the healing after six months without any intervention, and it was a myositis ossificans. Things can get, again, a bit complicated, like this case, 11-year-old gentleman, uh, boy, who had a history of trauma. This fracture was not handled properly, and, at, and when he had malunion, somebody did a biopsy of this lesion, and the biopsy in untrained hands in a pathologist can look really worrisome, and it was diagnosed as osteosarcoma. <coughs> Actually, it was not. Similar findings can happen in unicameral bone cysts, and I had a case a couple of months back as well, which has gone through all across Bombay and Ahmedabad, and we had similar cases where a healing unicameral bone cyst, if done a biopsy, can appear like an osteosarcoma, and similarly, this patient was diagnosed as osteosarcoma, but actually, if you see, it was the fracture healing. I'll just show this last case. I have lots more cases. I thought a little bit, because of lack of time, we'll maybe end up here. Very interesting. 32-year-old farmer, swelling of right shoulder since two years, and in six months, it, it has grown rapidly. <coughs> this was his uh, x-ray at presentation, where there was lysis of the clavicle, which is a large soft tissue mass, and the CT scan was done outside, which showed the same thing. There were differential diagnoses of metastatic deposit, a big aneurysmal bone cyst or GCT or plasma <coughs> cytoma, and this patient was operated with wide excision. Any guesses here? Any guesses now? Any guesses now? 
It's actually a rhinosporidus is involved in the clavicle. Thank you so much for listening to me, and uh, I, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Yeah, thank you, Ashish, for that excellent presentation. We'll take questions at the end. I invite uh, Dr. Venkateshan again for simple bone cyst, the not so simple. Thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. Ashish has made my work easier. He has already uh, talked to you about the tumor mimics. So when Venkat gave this topic, not so simple SBC, I went to Dr. Shah Alam and said, sir, I've got a very simple topic. I think I'm going to smash it. And he said, OK, let's see. So uh, before I begin, I'd just uh, like to tell you that I was good at cracking MCQs. And the only thing I knew about simple bone cyst was this fallen leaf sign, because this was the one which was often asked in MCQs. So I thought I knew simple bone cyst because of this one single uh, point. But of course, what I found uh, in my journey is what I'm going to present today. So when I, talk, when I read about simple bone cyst for preparing for this talk, I went through this. They said it's a, uh, a non-neoplastic lesion that is seen mainly in childhood, but they account for the yes in phagnomashic. I thought, what exactly is this phagnomashic? These are differential diagnoses for simple bone cyst, and what uh, this might mean anything from fibrous dysplasia, enchondroma, GCT, non ossifying fibroma, osteoblastoma, metastasis, myeloma, aneurysmal bone cyst, hyperparathyroidism, infection. So all these things can present as lytic lesions, and these can be mimickers. I thought, how, would I, how on earth will I remember this phagnomashic? This is not simple. I found a better mnemonic, fog machines, but this came with a rider. There was a disclaimer which said, these lists are not exhaustive. I said, no, this cannot be true. But the very next day, I went to the clinic. I saw this seven-year-old boy with this lesion in the distal radius. I thought this was a simple bone cyst because I was reading simple bone cyst. Then I found the uh, MRI had multiple fluid fluid levels, but the biopsy, scarring, telangiectatic osteosarcoma. So the most important thing to take home is uh, simple bone cysts might look very simple to begin with, but if you are careful, you can find something which might be different, and actually it can be a great masquerader. So whenever you have a doubt in the diagnosis, please go for additional investigations, such as MRI, and if need, be a biopsy sometimes to help you with Confirm the diagnosis before you do anything with the simple bone cyst. Now, I'm, in, I'm, I'm now intelligent, so I thought I would manage simple bone cyst. I did MRI, MRI was fine. There was a subtle fracture in there, and this lesion healed up very nicely. Then again, I treated this nine-year-old boy, this with simple bone cyst, but it fractured. Oh no, why did it fracture? And there is a virus as well. So I went running to Dr. Chalam, what should I do with this? He asked me, is the cyst active? I thought, what does mean by active cyst? The active cyst will have no normal bone between the cyst and the physis, and it abuts the physis. But when the cyst is away from the physis like this, it is called a latent cyst. Oh, I got to know one more thing. We need to know whether the cyst is active or latent. I asked him, so will the cyst fracture only if they are active? He said, no. They can actually fracture even when they are inactive. So how do I manage them? So he taught me then there is something called a cyst index, which was given by Kaelin and McEwen. So how do you go about this? It's a very complicated process. You need to draw a trapezoid uh, along the maximum dimensions of this cyst, both at the base as well as in the proximal part. And you need to draw a line perpendicular to this. And we need to measure the length at the base, length at the proximal part, and measure the horizontal. And we need to measure the diameter at the diaphysis. And you have a complicated formula here, where cyst index is equal to L plus L, uh, L, L dash by 2 into H by divided by D square. And if it is more than 3.5 chance, there is a chance of fracture is high. Oh, I thought, this is not simple. However, he said he need to read up and come to get a simpler way of uh, assessing which cyst will fracture. But as, of course, a poor student, I didn't read up. And I asked him to help with this patient, but this patient disappeared. He came back to us with a malignated virus fracture. And uh, Dr. Shah Alam did an osteotomy for me, and this patient healed up nicely. As a poor student, I didn't read up at all, and I kept managing simple bone cysts until he, uh, I, I stuck with this 17-year-old boy with, presented with UBC. This time, I was very... Uh, intelligent. I did an MRI scan, delineate that it was an active cyst reaching up to the physis, and I thought I'd need to do something for it. But what actually should I be doing? How do I manage an uncomplicated cyst? I asked my friend, but he said the modalities can be more invasive things like a curatage or a flexible nailing or a plate fixation if there's a fracture, 
or it can be a less invasive things like a steroid injection, autologous bone marrow injection, or a local sclerosant agent. So I thought before I uh, get finished with the simple process, I need to read up myself, looked at the literature. Literature gave us classification, classification of simple bone cyst. Healed, if it is radiolucent area is less than one centimeter in size. Healing with the fact when the radiolucent area is less than 50% of the diameter with enough cortical bone to prevent fracture. Persistent cyst, if the radiolucent area is more than 50%, and recurrent cyst, if the cyst reappears in a previously obliterated area. And we went through journals. Uh, again, I didn't have any clarity. This journal, which, this article which compared operative versus steroid injection said there were major complications in 50% surgeries, whereas recurrence rate in steroid group was only 5%, whereas this uh, article from JBJS said healing response after steroid injections are still unpredictable. So I went back to Sir. He gave me a simple algorithm. If you have a cyst, if there is no fracture, you can try injections such as methylprednisolone or even polydocanol, which is a sclerosant. And if there is a subtle fracture, we may try conservatism because the balloon of fluid is uh, blown out now and the uh, new uh, fracture hematoma which goes into the cyst might actually heal up the cyst. However, these kids need to be followed up. However, if you have a fracture which is grossly displaced, then especially in a weight-bearing bone, we need to decompress the cyst and fix if the uh, fracture is unstable or if the child has very less remodeling potential. So, why polydocanol? We have had experience with polydocanol in treating aneurysmal bone cysts, and we have published this, our group has done this, and uh, we have got excellent results in ABC. And uh, So finally, for this patient, we had to do some surgery because we thought it's an active cyst, there is a cyst index is higher, so and we did this procedure where a patient was curated with a, a bone substitute and we did the plating, and the patient was fine. Then I became independent, now I'm knowledge, I practiced the, started practicing independently. This is a UBC in an 8-year-old treated by injection, healed up nicely. And this is a 7-year-old boy with an uncomplicated primary UBC. The cyst is uh, latent, and I did injections. Again, it healed nicely. Here, I had used polydocanol. Uh, so in a 7-year-old boy, again, it healed nicely. So whatever method you use, when you, once you puncture the balloon of the fluid and you kind of uh, 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 injure the membrane, the cyst tends to heal up. In this patient, I thought this is a subtrochantic area, high stresses, I should not uh, meddle up with injections, did a uh, nailing, and again it healed. So then I started doing some innovative options in here. Here you had a cyst in the proximal humerus, didn't heal with injections, so we put an arthroscope into it, looked at the cyst, cured all the membranes completely, thoroughly, and you can see the small tiny scars in there, and the cyst healed up. Of course, there is a varus deformity. I hope this will remodel in the future. I thought now I have mastered SPC, but I had this 10-year-old boy who had a UBC of the proximal femur. He did not follow up with injections very, uh, uh, very sincerely, and he landed up with a pathological fracture. I fixed it up. Of course, I was happy after this fixation, but uh, even after the implant removal, the patient still had a virus deformity. So the only thing I didn't consider was this child was older. So younger the child, there is more chance of remodeling. Older children, they are more prone for deformities. So that's the last lesson I had. So what do I do today? I see what is the age of the child. I see how big is the cyst. I see whether the cyst has a fracture. Will it, will it lead to a fracture? Is it active? Means it's growth to the, close to the physis, or is it away from the physis, or is this a primary or a recurrent cyst? Based upon all these things, I tailor my decision and manage my patients. So my take-home message for you today is very simple. The simplicity of a simple bone cyst lies only in its name. For a treating surgeon, it is not a simple bone cyst. Thank you. In fact, I've recommended changing the name from SBC to UBC. Thank you, Dr. Venkatesan, for a very nice presentation to truly show that bones, simple bones is not so simple. Now I call upon Dr. Ashish to give a second talk on aneurysmal bones, current concepts. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, <clears throat> next 10 minutes, we'll see how, how the management of aneurysmal bones cysts have changed over last decade and a half. And this has, this, this, this has actually got dramatic results and decrease in the morbidity. As you all of, all of you know that traditionally, 
the uh, benign aggressive lesions which ABC is part of has been treated with uh, surgery which involves a function preserving surgery which which will be a extended curettage and then reconstruction of that cavity with uh, either bone or cement and mostly bone because ABCs will be in children. Now, what it does is that it adds to surgical morbidity to the operative site as well as to the donor site if you are planning to have autograft. There can be a lot of complications like a lot of hemorrhage, incomplete excisions, physical injuries because these lesions are very close to the physis. It can lead to damage to the arterial cartilages. If you plan to reconstruct the cavities with allografts, you need to have facilities like bone banking, and then obviously after bony reconstruction, these patients need to be immobilized for a long period of time, and you can have morbidities as well. And after doing all this, there are a lot of papers which talks about local recurrences in the rate of 10 to 30 percent, and that's where we are still, we were still looking for the ideal option for treating these cystic lesions. And what is ideal? It will be which gives you the minimum morbidity and can lead to best disease controls. And that's where the shift have been happening that we need to look at more minimally invasive options rather than the bigger <coughs> complex surgeries. Looking at the literature, you will be surprised to know there were at least 14 to 15 kind of minimally invasive agents or, 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 or techniques which have been used tried to cure aneurysmal bone cyst right from the uh, ethanol to doxycycline as well. But what really made the difference, and I'm very proud to share these two articles from um, Shah's group, All National of Medical Sciences, which published in 2007 and then 10, which talks about how a simple sclerotherapy can lead to healing of these lesions, where a sclerosant which is used for varicose vein can heal these lesions very, very well. And this is all what I need to treat an arismal bone cyst. Now, Jamshidi needle, local anesthetics and suture, you anyways need to do a biopsy of that lesion. You just need to add a polydocanol or exclorol injection, which costs about 27 rupees per ampule. So 3% polydocanol, what it does is that it leads to uh, the damage of endothelial lining, it triggers the cascade of uh, coagulation and gives, it decreases the vascularity of the cavity and gives a chance for the host bone to heal and that's what happens. And this is one of the first cases where we had debate whether we should try or not because this is an area where it can cause fracture as Venkatesh also showed in the adult software engineer who came to me from Bangalore. After counseling we thought that we can do sclerotherapy and he was he was quite uh, um, comfortable with that. Once you drape these lesions, you need to localize them. And after giving local anesthesia, and uh, uh, what you need to do is you need to put your J needle inside, break all the septase by moving uh, your Jamshidi needle, so that when you give the drug, it reaches to all the, all the nooks and the corners of the cavity. You can aspirate to make sure that you are in the lesion, and then you put your sclerosant. You can keep your syringe there for a couple of minutes to prevent the backflow. And uh, trust me, it gives fantastic healing. And this is just with one injection. Now he's at eight year follow up and is doing fantastically fine. We review these patients at eight weeks. We look at the resolution of symptoms radiologically and by clinical examination and can subject them to second injections if required. Just imagine this massive aneurysmal bone cyst in a 12 year old girl. If we have to operate this patient, it will require maybe 5 liters to 10 liters of blood and maybe resection of the pelvis. And this was treated with three injections of the sclerosis and, and beautiful healing. This x-ray was at 24 months. Now she has about four years of follow-up. So advantage is that these are minimally invasive techniques with, which most of the time do not require general anesthesia or hospitalization. We do them in the minor OT as a daycare procedure. Avoid surgical morbidity. It's easy to perform. Uh, so your learning curve is not much. Results are very reproducible. Minimal complication rates with good healing and is cost effective. We did the cost analysis at Tata Memorial Center and we found that by treating with sclerotherapy is 12 times less costly as compared to an open surgery. So we, we just published a paper in JBJS where we found that 48% of aneurysm bone cysts heal with just one single injection, and our overall healing rate was 88%.
but there are still those 12 percent patients who do not heal with sclerotherapy and they still grow so what can be the reasons number one you may have had an incorrect diagnosis now these are giant cell rich lesions if, if you do not see the imaging properly and if pathologists are not expert this can be confused with other giant cell lesions like giant cell tumors or transjectic osteosarcomas your technique may not be really appropriate. You may not be giving the adequate quantity of the sclerosant. Your lesions may be very large, which may require multiple sitting, and you think that you are failing. In our series of about 120 ABCs, we found that the proximal humerus lesions and the pelvic lesions require multiple sitting, and they may fail. We don't know the reason yet. And recurrent lesions after post-surgery may or not behave the same way. So what options we have to tackle these situations? You can do angioembolization, either standalone or in combination with the sclerotherapy. You can do a minimally invasive curopsy under GA and sclerotherapy, and still they don't heal. You can do curatage or resection. And to support the, the, the logic, there's a case here of aneurysmal bone cyst of the pelvis in a 20-year-old girl where uh, male, where this, this big lesion, which is in the periastabular area, these are the MRI pictures showing fluid, fluid level, after three injections, didn't show much of the healing, and we thought this is not the right way we are going ahead. We augmented it with angioembolization along with the sclerotherapy. This is after three injections, and that's a 30-month follow-up of the same patient. Another patient, a young girl from uh, Department of Atomic Energy, and she was studying her engineering, and she came to me about a couple of, uh, three years back with a subperiosteal aneurysmal bone cyst on the tibia, as you can see. MRI showed fluid, fluid levels. And uh, this was the picture after uh, four weeks after first sclerosant, and she, f she said that lesion has not decreased, but after eight weeks, the lesion increased. We did the MRI again. We saw there's a big uh, ex expansion of the lesion, and obviously it was cosmetically uh, challenging for her to wear her clothes and, and dress, so we went ahead with surgery, and this is a three-year follow-up of this patient. So how we treat ABCs now is every primary aneurysmal bone cyst, after it has been discussed in multidisciplinary department in, in, in our institute, we subject them to uh, sclerotherapy. Once uh, uh, they have passed about eight to 10 weeks, we reassess them with clinical examination and radiological findings. If we feel healing in both, uh, uh, both in radiographs as well as uh, the clinical symptoms, we can wait. If not, we can resubject to them sclerotherapy. If after multiple attempts you feel that these lesions are refractory, then as, as, as I mentioned, the reason you need to find out what can be the reason. If it is still aneurysmal bone cyst, you can augment your treatment with the help of angioembolization, or you can do a limited curopsy. If they heal well and good, if not, you then might have to go for surgical therapy in maybe less than 2 to 3 percent of the cases. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Ashish, we finished well in time. I think we have some time for some questions. Um, Excuse me. Dr. Yeah, my Ramani. question. Yeah. Right, Dr. Ramani. Yeah. Can I, uh, I, I just want to share an experience. Wonderful papers, all of you. Uh, the experience, uh, we had a case uh, which, uh, unusual bone cyst, we took the child up for uh, sclerotherapy. And uh, this one, uh, we took the, the child was in the OT, protected environment. This kid, we injected, followed everything to the T. There's no question of us making any mistakes. This kid had a tremendous adverse reaction to polydocanol. And this, we almost lost that kid. And the, the pediatric intensivist, the cardiologist, pediatric cardiologist, everybody was called in. And we, and I think uh, amiodirone amio was used and that kid was uh, revived. What I'm trying to say is, this got, we, we published this case report, it's there. Now what I'm trying to say is, I'm not saying that obviously polydocanol is safe, but it has to be injected in a protected environment. So my, my just uh, this thing, because now I've shifted to calcitonin and uh, methyl pred. I don't use polydocanol anymore. But I'm not saying that we should not use polydocanol, but it should be done in a protected environment. I absolutely agree. I mean, Ashish is more experience in polydocanol. We don't do it in our center. So uh, if I have to look at the data, uh, I may have data of about more than 300 patients uh, all across India, AIMS group, ourselves, and the IMSOS group 
this is actually the first time I'm hearing uh, such a reaction. So we need to be very careful if this has happened. Uh, we also need to look at if there are any other associated reasons for that to happen because uh, internationally also we have not found and, and peridoconol is a very well established sclerosin which has been using which which we which we have been using for decades together for uh, var uh, varices esophageal varices and uh, and varicose vein as well so maybe if this is one of the cases we need to uh, do a SWOT and see w w what was the reason and uh, read, need to the reach to the cause of it and then maybe look at if we have an, uh, other better options no, there was no associated we, we went through before we got the thing uh, the case report published we absolutely made sure that the child did not have any pre-existing condition point taken sir okay uh, dr ashish uh, do you do uh, core biopsy before you embark on uh, polydocanol or it's only a clinical radiological mri based diagnosis and then straight away go for polydocanol as a matter of teaching, I always say that you need to do a biopsy and prove it that it is aneurysmal bone cyst and then do the injection of polydocanol. Having said that, the institutional environment where you have MDT, where you have a radiologist who is, who is a very experienced musculoskeletal radiologist, where you have a team of orthopedic oncologists who has been seeing about 3,000 new patients every year for decades together, this, this scene is slightly different. There, what you can do in controlled environment, you can do biopsy and sclerosin at the same time. And if you, you, do, if you, you do it... And you it, take the frozen? Uh, I mean, No, no, no. You, once you have the MDT evaluation where every single case where we do sclerosin is discussed in MDT with the radiologist, you have the features on the MRI that there's no soft tissue component. It's only a cystic cavity with multiple fluid fruit levels. It's, it's screened by more than two radiologists at a time and obviously more than two orthopedic calls at a time. If everybody feels that it's a primary ABC, then we go ahead, we do a biopsy and we put the sclerosin. But if I have to put it on the open where we don't have such controlled environments, I will say there's no harm in doing a biopsy first and then doing the sclerotherapy. I'll just add on to that. You have to be very careful of this entity called telangiectic osteosarcoma which is a mimicker of aneurysmal right. bone cyst. Even the pathologists find it difficult to call it an aneurysmal bone cyst or a telangiectric osteosarcoma. In fact, there are now markers for that, some USP6. So even the pathologists find it difficult to call an aneurysmal bone cyst from a telangiectric osteosarcoma. Even if you use USP6, in 20% of cases it will not be possible and you will not be able to differentiate. That's why, I, that's why I was very particularly saying that in a controlled environment where I know what you're doing, you're not causing any harm by injecting that sclerosin, maybe. But as a general teaching for an orthopedic surgeon, I think it is best to get a diagnosis and then put the sclerosin. Or you put a sclerosin in a way that you will not cause any contamination. Same question. Oh, yeah. Sandeep. Okay. No, the extension of the same thing, sir. So, like tens, using tens in uh, UBC. So, pathological fracture. Child has come with a pathological fracture. Let us say. Uh, if it is weight-bearing bone, we can go for uh, uh, elastic stable intermodal nailing. Can it be done in the first instance, like uh, after MRI clinical? We are convinced it is UBC, or again, uh, is biopsy necessary? Sure. For uh, Dr. Uh, Sandeep has a similar question. I'm not sure. No, so you. I am. I, I know what I am doing. So, so I don't a have a question bearing, about it. It's, so for a weight-bearing like, bone. In the Tata group, which is stuck up. So for a, for your answering a question for a weight-bearing bone like the lower limb bones, you have to fix as the well fracture. As well as let us say if there is humerus fracture. A humerus uh, can be managed conservatively. Conservative, yeah. yeah. You don't need to put in a nail. Uh, depending on the age of the child, if it's less than eight, you can just aspirate or put steroids or tickle. The, like in the Toronto group, they just put a. Uh, cure it, did a percutaneous office procedure, put him in a cast, that also heals. So in a weight-bearing bone with path fracture, you have to fix the bone. So I think uh, the sense of the question was, do you need to biopsy an unicameral bone cyst? That's why, if I understand. So the actual reason, I uh, think, is unicameral bone cyst can be a clinical radiological diagnosis. It is one of the no-touch lesions where the clinical radiologically, you can be very sure that it is UBC. For to be sure, you need to have a single loculated cavity, and there should not be multiple loculations or fluid fluid levels, and there should not be any soft tissue. Okay, so once you have this safe criteria, and if you believe your radiologist, then unicameral bone cyst doesn't actually require 
biopsy confirmation every time. I just put it very simple. If you are embarking on to any surgical procedure, it is best to have a histopathological diagnosis. I'm not saying that you are wrong always, but you may be right nine times or eight times what happens with that one time or two time. For that patient, it is 100%. And that is where we sort of, you know, take okay. shortcuts and then issues happen. Thank you. So if you are observing, as, as Thomas said, that if you are observing, if you are just waiting for fracture to heal, if you have seen the clinical history, patient already had a lesion, you have sequential x-rays, your clinical story fits into the picture, you may, not, you may just observe the patient. But like in lower limb, you want to put a tense nail or you want to put a cannulated screw. If you're, if you're embarking on to a surgical procedure, you must make sure that you have a diagnosis because if it is something else, then it may lead to further consequential uh, issues. Hey, Dr. Sandeep? Yeah, so Ashish just asking for a recalcitrant or a large aneurysmal bone cyst which you have given one sclerosant and has partially or not responded, does the dose change, how much more will you inject? In the sense, what is your upper limit of putting the sclerosant? 8 ml, 10 ml, 20 ml, how, what is the largest? And uh, yeah, I, yeah. Want to, I want to thank Dr. Sandeep for this question actually because that was not covered in the talk. And <coughs> it's a debate which always happens. Now, if you ask me frankly, I don't know the answer what is the right dose. I've spoken to Shah Alam, I've spoken to Dr. Rastogi from where these two papers came. One paper says that the maximum dose is 6 ml, other paper says the maximum dose is 10 ml. So we don't know what is the exact dose. But over the experience of more than 100, uh, 100 cases, what I have realized that larger the lesion, you require multiple sittings and we don't give more than 6 ml to 7 ml. This is what we practice, but I'm not sure whether that is the right thing or not. You may be able to give 10 cc also, which is also fine. Now, Lesion like pelvises where 10 cc or even 8 cc of, of sclerosant may not be able to cover the whole yeah, cavity. Exactly. And what we do is that over the evaluation, we assess them radiologically. And after two or three injections, if you are planning to inject more, we do one more MRI to see which area is still not addressed. Then maybe under image guidance or a CT guidance, we target that area and then make sure that the drug reaches that area. So do you use arthrography? to find out? Yes. Many a times if I feel that I'm not sure about whether the cavity is contained or not, especially if you have the, like I showed the periestabular lesion where you have the vital structures there, or lesions of the proximal tibia where you have the neurovascular structure very close, we use the urographin as a dye to see wh whether the cavity is contained or not. If it is contained, we can go ahead. If it is not, then we wait a little bit, or this may not be the right candidate for doing a sclerotherapy. Yeah. Another example is post elements of spine, where we are very, very scared and we don't do, and we, we, we put these patients on either, either for uh, a simple surgery or we go ahead with angioembolization. All right, and just as a continuation, when you put in the needle, actually all that blood just gushes out yes. through that. Do you yes. wait for everything to come off and then wash it with saline? No. Then <laughs> you give the sclerosant. Is there a technique no, so or is it just, you just inject? So what I do is I, I inject the Jamshidi needle and there's a gush of serosanguinous fluid which comes out. It'll keep coming out because yeah. the cavity is so vascular. Yeah. And as you wait more, you will see that the, 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 the color of the blood is becoming more pinker and pinker because the fresh bleeding is happening. So what you need to do is break the septase and you go to the lining of the walls, you yeah. scrape that, Take that bias. And, and just inject it, yeah. hold it there for two to three minutes till now. By God's grace, everything is going any fine. Any subcutaneous necrosis or any reaction on the skin because of backflow? Out of 120 patients, three patients had itching. Other Except that, for no. that, we have not had any, okay. Thank you. any issues. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Last, uh, just continuation questions. of the question series. Yeah. If uh, like a lesion of proximal humerus, which is a large lesion, you know that it is responding but not responding completely. <coughs> so what is the usual frequency for a standard ABC we will give and how, uh, more, how more frequently can you give? So as I told you, um, initial part of the series, we started do doing this in 2010 and, and first time I presented uh, in ISOLs in Rizzoli in 2012. You know, our average time of seeing patients were about five weeks. 
and you know it's a blessing in disguise we we get patients from kashmir to kanyakumari all across india the patients from far east or north they were not coming at six weeks time and during the follow-up we realized the patients who are coming a bit later on like eight weeks nine weeks they are having good healing and we don't have to do a second injection and that is where we realized that i think six weeks is not that it's not the adequate time for bone to respond so then we moved that six week to eight weeks so now we do not take a call to inject second injection at least before eight weeks it may be 10 weeks also you need to assess your patient clinically have the symptoms gone down and are you seeing any sclerosis and thickening of the cortices on x-rays if you have both of them your decision is done wait if you have one of them then you need to decide case by case basis is it lower limb is it femur is it upper limb upper limb you can be you know wait a bit more but if after two to three injections we feel that it is not responding the way it should we first thing which we, we do is revisit the histopathology because that is very very important and then otherwise augment with angioembolization or other things okay, okay last eight, question eight, eight dr gopinath the cutting line we're running out of time uh, we'll discuss over it. dr yeah. gopinath yeah. do, yeah. do you ever give it in a pathology when there's a associated pathological fracture no sir if it is not healed no Okay, with that, we'll come to the end of the session. I thank all the panelists and the audience for a... And Dr. Suhas Bala. We are going to start the last session, Catches in Matches. Yeah, I, I think we are coming to the last wicket. We are batting on the last wicket. And uh, we are going, hopefully going to see some interesting cases here. Uh, I would uh, request Dr. Sanjeev Sabarwal to present his case difficult cases. Thank you. So this is what, six minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I want to thank uh, my current partner, uh, Jason uh, Jagodinsky. So I, I moved about uh, a year and a half ago to California. So he presented me with this case of his and asked me to help him a little bit. So it's his case and I helped him in the OR and then he followed the patient. But I thought it was an interesting uh, teaching case. So this is a 13-year-old type 1 uh, osteogenesis imperfecta, imperfecta who presented with worsening anterior right knee pain. And uh, as you can see, he had uh, 20 plus prior surgeries, multiple orthopedic procedures. For, and I think he had a real allergy to bisphosphonates. It apparently would get uh, anaphylaxis with uh, several different bisphosphonates, had a mild leg length discrepancy. And on clinical exam, as you can see in the middle picture, He's got, uh, you know, some hyperextension at the knee. His x-rays were more impressive. And you can see he's got a recurvatum of the proximal tibia. He has a previously implanted intramedullary nail of an older generation. And, um, and we'll ignore the left side for now. And if you look, look at the deformity analysis, his, most of his deformity was in the proximal tibia with an MPT of 100 and a PPT of 115, which is the most significant. And if you were to do deformity analysis and planning, and you drew an anatomic PPT of 80 degrees and a mid-diaphyseal line, and just ignored the recurvatum distally for now, you could see that the apex of the deformity comes right where the patellar tendon would be. So the issue is many-fold. Here, by the way, is the CT, which again may, may not have been totally necessary, but you can see that he's got a central growth defect. And again, what the x-rays showed, that he's got that uh, posterior translation with recurvatum of the proximal tibia. So I think the issues to resolve are some of these, which is how to correct the tibial deformity with this nail in place. If we were to correct it, what do you do with the nail? Do you take it out? And if we were to take it out, what approach do we use? And if we are going to leave the nail in and do an angular correction around the nail, how do you stabilize the soft bone that is uh, around the nail proximally? And what do you do with the extensor mechanism if you were going to do the osteotomy at the, at the cora? So um, anyway, so what we did is, again, it's not like a very grand case, but I think it's a practical case for when you're, uh, when, when you're dealing with soft bone with a previously implanted nail, and how do you do osteotomies around the nail? So in this case, we did a jiggly saw osteotomy for the posterior and the lateral and the medial cortex, 
and did a multiple drill hole in the front. We obviously did not complete the osteotomy at this point. And then um, this is just a picture, two transverse incisions, one anterolaterally, one uh, slightly posteromedially, pass the jiggly saw over a heavy suture, you know, put a little knot, multiple knots with a little thing, and you usually put a straight, like a tonsil clamp from the anterolateral incision and a right angle clamp with the suture from the posteromedial incision. Make sure you're totally subperiosteal. And then you almost have to close your eyes and feel the two ends of the snap meet. And before you release your tonsil, you just have to move it a little bit and make sure that you've got the suture. And then you open the posteromedial right angle clamp and then pull the suture. It's really not that hard once you get a feel of it. Uh, so Paley and others have described this and it's pretty straightforward. So then once you've put your um, bony anchors, half pins, wires around, uh, you complete the osteotomy. You also do a distal fibular osteotomy and then just a standard gradual correction of the, of the deformity in both planes. And so this is him three months later where he's going into early consolidation. And then the next challenge is what happens with the regenerate and how do you protect it? Because some of the regenerate is proximal to the intramedullary implant. And by the way, our osteotomy was just distal to the attachment of the, of the patellar tendon. So you did have to do some obligate. So this is what uh, Jason did. He took the frame out, and a week later, after some pin holiday, antibiotics orally, he came back and did a percutaneous or you know minimally invasive plate just to protect the regenerate internally. And so uh, here is uh, his clinical picture. His knee pain has resolved. His gait has substantially improved. And I think they're planning to do something to the left side. So very briefly, you know, history of um, um, the jiggly saw osteotomy. I mean, Elizarov uh, was a proponent of a corticotomy as opposed to doing an intramedullary uh, violation of the canal. Um, and it's interesting if you go back, and I know Dick Gross was here a few years ago as a Posna faculty. When he visited uh, this surgeon uh, in Afghanistan, uh, and I think they, they reported on 50 plus cases of doing a similar jiggly saw osteotomy in JPO. And I think uh, Paley probably got the idea from the surgeon, perhaps. Um, and then, you know, the issue is people have looked at it. Jiggly saw osteotomy, how does it compare with other um, osteotomy techniques, including the De Bestiani or the multiple drill hole osteotomy? And it's very similar in terms of distraction osteogenesis and bone regeneration. This was one nice paper which compared head to head the De Bestiani and the Jiggly saw, and bone regeneration is pretty similar, and as you would expect in the proximal tibia, anteriorly, you get a slightly poorer uh, regenerate because of less soft tissue and violation of the periosteum. Other indications are, this is another neat indication, if you've got to, if you, let's say you have a malrotated uh, femur fracture, which is not that uncommon, then you can do a distal femoral osteotomy. You cannot do the osteotomy with a jiggly saw sort of proximally in the mid-diaphysis because of the uh, femoral vessels, but in the distal diaphysis or metadiaphysis, you can do it, take the locking screws out, derotate acutely, leaving the nail in place, and do it that way. The other sort of very common area is the midfoot, and I was just talking to Viraj uh, right here. So while he may do it with a saw, if you need to do gradual correction, I think a jiggly saw through the midfoot is a very powerful technique. Uh, so in summary, I think it's a jiggly saw osteotomy, something that you can use when uh, you need a very precise low energy osteotomy. It gives you satisfactory bone healing, but you have to be safe protect the surrounding soft tissues, know what the neurovascular anatomy is, and it, it is useful in tight spaces such as around intramedullary implants and midfoot osteotomies. Thank you. So that's an interesting way of doing it. Do you think a corticotome would have been as useful as that, as uh, described by Elijah earlier? A corticotomy so I think without doing an osteotomy? Two, two issues with the corticotomy. One is that if you're doing it sort of the Elizarov way, a lot of times you can create spin, splintering and it's not a very clean cut. And, and secondly, you know, it's been like nowadays we do, you know, intramedullary lengthening through the precise nail where the whole nail 
is in the canal and still you get a good regenerate. So I think the original Ilazarov thought that you have to preserve the intermedullary vascularity for bone regeneration is not totally accurate because a lot of the bone regenerate happens uh, around the periosteum. So as long as you're careful with subperiosteal dissection and preserving the periosteum, I, I think you get good re regenerate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev. Go on to Dr. Ramani Nasiman for his difficult case. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, uh, as we, this is the last session, so I take the opportunity to acknowledge the tremendous uh, effort by the organizers to put together this academic feast. I thank Dr. Raj Shekharan and uh, Venkat who have really uh, put in and all the people behind the sign, uh, scene, scenes who have uh, worked to give us such a beautiful uh, experience. Uh, I, apart from the academics, even the accommodation, food and the whole experience has been wonderful. So thank you very much. So uh, this particular case, I think it's a teaching case. I've already shared in certain other uh, 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 fora. But uh, this is a, uh, a, a three-year-old girl presented with a waddling gait, noticed by the parents since the past one year then. No history of any previous treatment, no other significant history. So pre-op assessment, this, is the, this was the pre-operative case. The hips were actually a little flexible. So we, the problems that we see are high-riding femoral heads, but they were flexible, shallow acetabuli, mobility outside the joint, short stature, bilateral supratrochanteric shortening, abnormal gait, and the pre-op planning, the aim was concentric reduction of the hips and managing the reduction. The child was still small, so generally I take up, whenever there is a bilateral case, we take the, take the child up and we, we do one side when we have to do an extensive procedure on one hip and do the other side three to four days later, and that's what we planned. It was an open reduction supplemented by both femoral and pelvic procedures, so adductor tenotomy, OR, femoral shortening, followed by various derotation osteotomies of the proximal femur, and then, he, then we planned the DEGA osteotomy, and followed by a hip spiker. So this is uh, the, the perooperatively, we, we, we tackled all the obstacles to the open reduction, as we all know. So everything went off, was, was going fine. It was an open reduction. Uh, we, we, the, we, we see this is the standard anterior approach that I use. Then we did this DEGA osteotomy and uh, uh, the standard way, it has already been discussed in the workshops and perooperatively we fixed the, the, this was one of my older case, nowadays we use the blade plates as well as the proximal femoral plates, but that time we used the, the standard uh, plates uh, and did the osteotomies, put the graft which was taken from the shortening that we did of the proximal femur. So uh, this is the standard per operative situation. This was the picture immediate at post-op. So we were reasonably fine at that particular point. And I, I, I am absolutely very, very, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I take it upon myself and I actually urge everybody and most of us are doing it that we put the spica ourselves, the very, at least the very first spica. So this was the x-ray after five weeks. So it was a little disconcerting to see this hip dislocated. So uh, again, I mean, we know through literature that lots of hips get uh, dislocated when you are actually putting the spike on at the, at the initial phase. But then we took it in our stride, counseled the parents, and this was tackled at six weeks by an open reduction readjustment of the distal alignment temporary smooth K wire, though I don't like it, but at certain situations we have to put these wires. And uh, uh, then, of course, the wires were taken away uh, when the, after six weeks when the child was again tackled. So we had this uh, check x-ray after three months. This was the second post-op. This child was in a one and a half hip spica because the other side was doing pretty well. And this was uh, after 10 months of the initial surgery. So. Now, what was happening was, this was the range of motion after one year. And here is the child having a stiffness over the right hip, we, that was expected. But you, we also know that the, we had to immobilize the hips for a longer period of time. So, 
Then this was after 15 months, the hips were doing reasonably well, the left side of course was doing good, the right side was a little stiff, otherwise it was looking good, everything was doing fine, this was a standing posture and this was how she was walking at 15 months. The stiffness had reduced, the child was more comfortable and the parents were happy, the physiotherapy was going on and everything was going fine. So there were smiles all around, we, we all heaved a sigh of relief and for me it was a little bit of an embarrassing situation at that particular point of, point of time when the right hip was dislocated but things were going fine. But then post-op this was what happened, over enthusiastic physiotherapy, the right side immobilized for a longer period of time, immobilization, immobilization uh, stiffness and which was being you know because the left side was good there was a more enthusiasm this was a stress fracture, so uh, stress riser and fracture. So this was uh, open reduction again at 16 months, at 19 months we did this. At 26 months this whole thing healed. After four years, here we have this child doing perfectly well. Well, I think we got lucky, I mean the point is that you do face a lot of problems, there are complications and what we have to understand, the carry-on message, pre-op family counselling is extremely important. It's uh, adequate, trained, adequately trained personnel have to tackle these complicated problems and sometimes it's not bad to take help of somebody who is more trained. Ho hospital setup is definitely required for these complex cases. Proper pre-operative assessment and planning is important. Per operative flexibility and adaptability is important. Proper follow-up, of course. Anticipate the complications. Always keep the family informed. Confront the problems and manage decisively. Never hesitate to discuss with colleagues and refer when necessary. And ha I'm happy to say that this particular girl came to me uh, the father comes to me with this girl, but not to show his own daughter, but he brings in some other family because he has total explicit trust in me because I kept him informed. So it's important to keep the family informed, take their trust and then go forward. Thank you very much. I think that's an important message to take home that you need to keep the family in the loop whenever you take a decision on on any patient, in fact. I think I'll call Dr. Viraj for him to present his difficult case. Once again, thanks to uh, Venkat, Sangeet, uh, Dr. Shetty, and uh, Professor Raj Shekhan, sir, for uh, giving us a fantastic uh, this feast of all the live surgeries as well as the talks. Thank you once again, and uh, congratulations for this wonderful conference. So uh, this case is uh, this is uh, just uh, you must be remembering the famous dialogue of Shah Rukh Khan that don't underestimate the power of common man. Yeah, if you have seen that Chennai Express movie, I think majority of must have seen, right? So just uh, uh, this is a seven-year male child. He, he had a of fall from 12 feet and then injury to the right elbow as well as the right forearm. So if you take the closer look, this was uh, uh, injury and these were the wounds. This is a sharp object which has gone through the forearm entry and exit wounds and there was injury to the uh, elbow as well and these were the x-rays so there was fracture supracondylar humerus as well as there was a fracture of the ulna isolated fracture of the ulna so what should be the plan of treatment so if you see the x-ray we we decided that we should uh, closely reduce the fracture supracondylar humerus and we reduce it closely we just pinned it and there was a we contaminated at the wound, so we, we have opened uh, to uh, debride and uh, that wound, so we thought that we have already opened, so let us plate the ulna, right? So we just put a one third tubular plate for the ulna, okay? So that was uh, the post-operative x-ray. Post-operative patient uh, went uh, on doing well, three days of IV antibiotics were given, asymptomatic, no fever and on fifth day we discharge also. After four weeks, we, the pins were removed. And this was post-injury three months. If you see the x-ray, uh, everything looks fine. So, uh, I mean, 
we were happy, patients were happy, and uh, we thought that everything is uh, fine, that, that that should be the happy end, right? But it was not. The child was very active, he had a second fall while playing in the school. Now, this was a four month after first injury. So, this time now there is a fracture ulna and there is a fracture radius, okay? And there is a bend of the plate, so there is a uh, re fracture at the ulna site, okay? So, how to go ahead about now? I counsel that this requires some kind of intervention, surgeries and all, parents were not ready for surgery. They said, doctor, whatever you want to do, do it closely or we don't want to um, pose the child for further surgical intervention. So, what choice I had, I just took the child under operating room, reduced the fracture closely, just uh, bend up a plate and uh, just cast it. Right, so the cast was given. The cast was continued for six weeks, and uh, uh, the radius united. But if you see the ulna, there is a trouble. Okay, um, this time again, I, now I said to the parent that boss, something has to be done. You know, so this this can't be. I can't just uh, uh, leave the child like that. They said no, no, we are not ready for this time. The cast, not any surgery, but uh, whatever you advise, that will follow. So. Then I decided to give him a corset, you know, brace. So this kind of where the child is able to move the forearm, uh, sorry, uh, move the elbow and uh, protect it. And just I, I thought that I will wait for the union. I was fortunate at four months from the second trauma. Now there is some, uh, if you see the alna, there are signs of union, right? It has started showing signs of union. So I was happy that, okay, now everything should go well. But was that the end of story? No. The child was very active. He used to wear the brace in front of parents. As soon as he go to school, he should, he used to throw it off and just went to went for the play, right? And he had a third fall, right? And this was again. Now there is a ulna as well as the radius. What to do? The parents again came back in the night that this is there. I said, I warned you that this has to be tackled nicely and then and you are not willing. So they say, doctor, whatever you want to do, but we don't have money and we are not ready for you. Just try it. similar way what you did for the first time or the second time. I said, okay, they are not opted for surgery, so I, but they were, this time they are ready for the cast. Again, I reduced it, put under the plaster, you know. So, and the cast was removed after two months and I advised them to use the corset for a longer time and warn them not to send child to the school, right? Because if you go to school, he will again have the fall and again have the injury. I was fortunate that after six months, the radius united, Allah also showed the signs of union, I protected further and uh, once the Allah was, I was completely satisfied that Allah is united, I took up the implants. So child started going to school, but this time warned that he should not be allowed to run or play at least for another six months till the time, even the holes which are there, the we took up the implant, they should also heal nicely and this is a one and a half year follow up the first injury. So what lessons I learned, don't underestimate the power of a active child, right? So, uh, I mean, this is on the, on the lighter note, but if you serious note, incomplete isolated uh, fracture of a single bone forearm, sometimes they take longer time for union. That one should remember in mind. So, the proper x-rays are very important. The, uh, the, the supraconda humerus was united. That doesn't mean that the ulna was also united. I should have been more careful. If I go back and see, the ulna was not united completely and it would have been protected for the longer period of time. And I don't know, for the debridement, I opened the wound, so I plated the ulna. I don't know whether it was the right decision to uh, made me, it, it, it might have been the overkill. So I thank you for your condition. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Viraj. I'll call Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan for the last over of the match. <laughs> Venkat really made sure I don't leave. <laughs> okay, so my worst case, since there's nothing else after this, I'll take a bit of time because it's a teaching case again. It's like a horror movie. So, this child, we were discussing bone cysts earlier and Ashish was here. So, this child with fractured through a simple bone cyst somewhere in Maharashtra. And this is his surgery. An open reduction, cure attach, bone grafting and fixation. So everything looked hunky-dory and things should have gone well. But uh, like they say in India, ek pay ek free. This is what he came to me with, right? So he had a slip. There was a stiffness which was created at the epiphyseal junction. So he had a slip. If you see the density of the head is increased, suggestive of maybe AVN. And the implant has walked off. 
backing out and walking off from the top of the neck of the uh, femur. And uh, it didn't stop there because of that back of the implant, he developed a bursa and started a discharging sinus to add infection to that. So now I have a situation of a hip in an adolescent, about 11 years old, loose implant, infection, slip in a cyst. What next? So that is the whole situation that I was faced with. So again, like I said, we, I, I tried to be a superman or God. I said, let me fix everything. So what did I do? I, I reduced the slip as gently as I could after I removed the implant. So implant removal curated out the whole uh, cavity. I packed that with, uh, this is an old case about 10, we didn't have calcium sulphate. So this was G bone mixed with a little bit of antibiotic. And I stabilized that in whatever position. And the discharge around that was sent for culture. I thought a titanium screw should be good in presence of infection. Culture grew staff. So patient, after the surgery was all right, he was somewhat better, but not fully comfortable. He was an oral antibiotic, I put him in a thomas splint. When I removed the splint, he had severe pain, which was not tolerable. So I revisited the x-ray and in my enthusiasm, what had I missed? Subluxation. So the hip had also moved out and if I saw, the medial joint space was increased. So probably I just took it for granted that the implant is infected, but there was also septic arthritis. So there was infection within the joint. So I had to go in again. I went from a medial approach this time. I drained, there was collection, an abscess there, which I drained and sent for culture again. Now the head, uh, the position of the hip looks much better. So I put him in a spica, abduction spica braced him for three weeks after which obviously four and a half months had passed and everything I thought should be okay after a long struggle and four and a half months looked decent but his knee was stiff so again I said okay let me give him the best result so I took him under anesthesia and gently manipulated the knee and caused a supracondylar fracture so another message a stiff knee don't ever try to manipulate so he got a supracondylar fracture. We had to cast him again. Fortunately, it went off and healed well. This is his status after one year. He's walking around, limping. I have stopped being any more heroic, trying to do any more for his hip. But the XA looks something like this. Right? So at present, we have just left him alone. I waited on him, asked him to do physio. And this is at maturity. He's now 18, going to college, and that's his function. So, in the end, pretty good. He's got a decent range. He can squat, he can sit cross legged. He limps, but he doesn't have any pain, and he's carrying on activities of daily life just fine. So, just to move on, aspiration of the cyst and steroid injection seems to be the most common treatment which is being followed, which is minimally invasive. So opening, putting a big bone graft and stabilization may not really be uh, a, a real, really required. When you aspirate a simple bone cyst, you get sort of a yellowish straw colored fluid as compared to uh, the hemorrhagic fluid that you get more in aneurysmal bone cyst. And of course, an MRI will show you fluid fluid levels. Or you can have a situation where your cyst index is high and just an intramedullary rod can heal the cyst on its own. So minimally invasive techniques have been described. If you look at simple bone cyst, conservative treatment of path fractures causes healing of cyst only in 25% cases. But the 75% of them, the fracture heals, but the cyst does not heal. So the his cyst may need additional procedures for you uh, to make it heal. And that Kalin's index has been discussed, the widest diameter of the cyst and the diaphysis and divided observation for humerus with index of less than four. And in femur, the tolerance is a little lower. Strong consideration to surgery is appropriate if the child is active. Management is divided into open curettage and bone grafts, aspiration injection techniques or decompression and implantation. These are the three modalities available to you. 
the open curators techniques the results have been 53% healing 45 year old retrospective analysis at dupont uh, however a higher surgical mortality morbidity of infection and bleeding with bone graft and the volume of bone graft sometimes required is quite high aspiration techniques italian paper we started it off but you need about 76% patient need multiple injections and there is a 55% healing rate with a 45% improved cortical thickening but it's very low morbidity but it's not a one time injection you still have to do multiple injections people have tried bone marrow injections with these papers with a 95% healing rates other bone substitutes have been tried with percutaneous techniques this paper from budbhav sankar Uh, percutaneous trifination followed by calcium sulfate but the cost is a deterrent it's upward of 150 dollars decompression implantation some papers from japan where they just used uh, sort of reamers they they broke the cyst septae opened up the canal did not implant anything and then some put put some pellets or put a cannulated screw so that the cyst kept on draining continuously so that is one more method the elastic nail concept is not new published from 1968 onwards many times and by sara flinart and rofosh showed 94% healing rates in uh, 2000 and the latest the last paper uh, shows a 40% uh, 47 ubcs where you have about 65% completely healed and 34% with a little residual lucency but without any recurrence so the rod decompresses the cyst when you put the rod it allows the fluid to flow off into the marrow it breaks the septae maintains a continuous vascular channel supports your cyst while it follows its natural course and aligns the fracture when it heals so all these objectives can be best obtained if you do the elastic nailing technique so that is what i prefer thank you very much thank you sandeep I think with that we come to the end of this session. I hand over the mic to Venkat. It's, it's end of the conference actually, so we break for lunch now. Thank you, thank you, Anand.